So all he could do was read a script. He just doesn't know. But the chemist sees exactly what I see. But they claim something else. This is not okay. me telling you that I have the answer. This is me okay. telling you, like, hey, I have this idea. Do you think that we can push it further? There's great problems to saying something has been solved when it's not been solved. Did I say cancer has been solved? All sorts of cancers, they're all solved. Who's going to go into cancer research? But I do not disagree with you that there is life outside of cells. Mm -hmm. Jesus was life indeed. And each component is present in large enough quantities at the moment of mixing to nucleate the next crystal to grow. Okay. And? We have discovered a way to make hydrogen, H2, for free. So the Department of Energy has a program called the 111 program, started in 2021. They wanted to make one kilogram of H2 hydrogen for $1, being able to sell it for $1 in one decade. And we're not part of that program, but we've solved this. We make it not for $1, we make it for negative dollars. And so using a process that we discovered in 2018, published in 2020, where we take waste plastic and we flash joule heat it. We put it between two electrodes, put high voltage, a high current. It converts the plastic into graphene, this space age material that uh, looks like chicken wire at the molecular scale, individual sheets, extremely strong, nothing stronger at, the, at, the, at that size level because carbon-carbon bond is one of the strongest bonds in the universe, and each one of those carbon-carbon bonds is a bond order of 1.3, meaning that it has about 1.3 bonds between every two carbons. And then you have a sheet of this, and so we can make this now from the bottom up. We had shown that you can do it from any carbon source, coal, petroleum, coke, wood, anything, us, it's made out of carbon. But you can do it from waste plastic, so you can deal with that problem in the world. But... What's amazing is the gas that comes off during that is predominantly H2. And so you sell the graphene and then the H2 costs you nothing. You say, well, graphene costs a lot. Graphene is $60,000 to $100,000 a ton right now. Uh, no, but if even if we sell it for $3,000 a ton, one twentieth of the mm. lowball price, we're still able to make $4.30 per per kilogram we we negative four dollars and thirty cents per kilogram it costs us to make the hydrogen it's this is now the fuel source for the next century clean fuel there's only three elements in the periodic table that can be fuel for humankind that have the thermodynamic properties that have the abundance to be fuel for humankind one is carbon and that's what we've been using since we discovered fire <laughs> And then now we're dealing with, with, with a problem that p some people feel is a problem of the excess CO2. Whether that's a problem or not, it doesn't matter. It's going to have to be addressed because people view it as a problem. Mm. And so the other element is hydrogen, and the third <laughs> element is plutonium. So unless you want to go to a totally nuclear world, hydrogen is the way to go. And we've already got hydrogen vehicles fuel cell vehicles, you take hydrogen, mix it with air, oxygen, you get water as the only byproduct, no CO2. The problem with hydrogen today is you make it from steam methane reforming, where you take methane, natural gas, and you, you mix it with steam and a nickel catalyst, and you get, you get uh, hydrogen plus CO or CO2. So you're, and you make 11 kilograms of CO2 for every one kilogram of hydrogen that you make. Big, big problem. So hydrogen is not a clean fuel today because we don't know how to get it cheap, uh, uh, cleanly. You can electrolyze water, but that electrolysis project, pro process costs about uh, uh, $4.50 uh, per kilogram. So it just can't compete. And, uh, um, and that's using renewable energies. And, and so and then it also uses, I think it's uh, like nine gallons of water for, for 
it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a huge amount of water, which wouldn't be available in a lot of locales. So uh, um, this is going to be the way to go. This, this can really change the fuel source for the next generation. Uh, uh, so this is a big discovery, and uh, that paper's out for submission right now. Uh, isn't it isn't it transport the huge barrier with hydrogen fuel cells that you know people think of the hindenburg or something like that yeah so so um we have several pipelines already in the country that can transport hydrogen uh it, it's it's no it's no more it's it's no worse than gasoline mm. gasoline could never be approved today as a transportation fuel never if it had not been grandfathered in it's mm. extremely combustible and gasoline, when a tank ruptures, gasoline stays there. It drops down on the ground and gives a big thing of a big ball of flames. Hydrogen goes straight up. Uh, your tanks have to be high pressure. You can have a high pressure tank, 7,000 to 10,000 PSI. Uh, the tanks now uh, can be even made out of, out of a carbon-carbon composite. Uh, the problem is, is that those pressures, they do have to be spherical. So you have to put them, say, like under the back seat and build the car around them. Whereas right now with a gasoline tank, it's the last thing to be put in because you make it conformal. Mm. Uh, but but all, the, all the, the junctions are inserted into the tank. So it's very hard, very hard to rupture those. And when they rupture, the hydrogen goes straight up. So it's no more dangerous than a, than a gasoline car. But, but uh, uh, yes, it is high pressure. Uh, you have other ways of packaging hydrogen. You can convert, convert the hydrogen to ammonia if you want to, and and then once you have it in ammonia form, then it's it's much easier, and and, and then uh, you're generating H two in the process and N two nitrogen, and uh, and then you convert that that hydrogen into electricity. Every car company has fuel cell cars already. The problem always was the availability of the hydrogen. Mm. But hydrogen is a real fuel. Remember, electricity is not a fuel. Uh, the sun, wind, hydro, uh, hydroelectric, that, that, that's all energy, but it's not a fuel. A fuel is something you can put in a bottle mm. and transport and, uh, uh, and pass this thing around. So the, the, the best thing is a liquid, gasoline in that sense, the amount of energy that you can have contained in a certain volume. For hydrogen, you have to pressurize it. I've seen vehicles, uh, uh, exploratory vehicles, where they, have, uh, where they liquefy the hydrogen, but now you've lost 30% of the energy content just in the li liquefaction. Mm. But, uh, and even when you liquefy hydrogen, it's, it's a very non-dense liquid. Hydrogen has what's called a, a, a very low zero point energy, meaning that even at absolute zero, the hydrogen molecule, the H2 molecule, is moving around a lot. It has a, a very high zero, zero point energy so that the molecule H2 maps out as much space as the molecule benzene, C6H6, mm -hmm. because it's moving around so much. And so, yes, that is, that is a problem with it, that it is very low density. Hence, you have to, to really increase the pressure on this in, in a tank, and it's, it's, still, it's still a gas in that tank. Uh, so I, I think this is going to be a, a major advance for a fuel source while but, we are taking waste plastic off the streets. Okay, so I have two questions. Yes. The first is what about the energy requirements for generating the graphene in the first place? Yeah, yeah. So when I say $4.30, this is after complete LCA, uh, 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 life cycle assessment and techno-economic analysis. So you take all that into account. You take into account salaries, you take into account everything. So the amount of electricity that we put in to convert one ton of coal, one ton into graphene, and we get about uh, 900 kilograms of graphene, it's about 90% yield and 99% of what's in there is now graphene, is $30. $30 in electricity per kilogram. That's it. It's, it's one of the lowest manufacturing energies that you have to put in. And because it's not like we're heating a furnace, flash dual heating, this is done in about 100 milliseconds. So it's a lot of energy very quickly, high current, high voltage. But when you, we do this in the lab, when we started doing this, we would do this on, say, 100 milligrams. It, the temperature rises to over 3,000 Kelvin. So 3,000 Kelvin is very close to 3,000 centigrade, if people want to kind of be able to gauge this. 
there, there's only a, say a 270 degree difference between those two numbers. So so it heats up to about 3,000 Kelvin, over 3,000 Kelvin, in the first three milliseconds, two milliseconds, and that's enough energy for every bond in every molecule to break. Mm. And then it reconstructs as the most thermodynamically stable material, which is graphene. And all the hydrogen atoms that were in there are coming together and forming H2. It's, it's an amazing, amazing process. And then it's not even warm. It's only warm to the touch on the outside because it happens so quickly, there was little, very little heat transfer. So it's very different than using a furnace. So for, for, for uh, um, plastic, it, it's, it's, there's not as much carbon content, say, as in coal. So we might do $35 a ton. But it's, it's nothing, nothing in, in the production of this. This is why the, the company that we started to make graphene is putting every other graphene company out of business. It's, it's just changing the whole dynamic. And graphene's a naturally occurring compound. It's, it's, it's natural agglomerates are the natural mineral graphite. And the beautiful thing about it is this. Every asset that we bring up from under the ground, whether it's natural gas or, or oil or coal, every one of those assets is going to enter the CO2 cycle at some point. Even if you just, just strip the hydrogens off the, the, and, 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 use, and throw the carbon out, plants will take up that carbon, microbes will eat it, and it will form into the CO2 cycle at some point not graphene. Graphene is very slow to, to enter the CO2 cycle. And we know that. Uh, uh, that's why we have graphite in the world. If microbes could eat graphite, we would have no graphite mines. Hmm. So they're very slow to eat graphite. And graphite's been in our world, uh, graphene's been in our world a long time. Many years ago, when graphene research came, first came in, you, you know, if you, if you drink whiskey, that comes out of a charred barrel. And I told my students, I said, I bet, I bet, there's some graphene in there. And sure enough, I, I sent one of my students to get a bottle of whiskey and uh, uh, we ran a transmission electron micrograph and you can find graphene sheets. People have been ingesting graphene sheets. So, so uh, it's non-toxic, slow to enter the CO2 cycle again. You don't have to keep it forever. I mean, even if you slow it down by 100 years, we're going to have other sources of energy uh, uh, by that time and CO2 is not going to be a problem. Humans are going to have other problems. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's just a great story for the environment. And what are, sorry, yeah. I was going to say, what are the immediate applications of graphene that people might not be aware of? Excellent question, the one I was going to ask as well. <laughs> yes. So, so the worldwide use of graphene is about 15 to 20 tons per day right now worldwide. So it's a very small market. But that's because the price is high, $60,000 to $100,000 $60, $100, per ton. Put it in perspective, polyethylene is $2,000 per ton. So, you know, because most people don't buy things in tons, so they don't know what that means. Uh, but now you know. And, and, um, but is this in computer even, science or what, what is it? What are the, what's the primary output of like of, who's, bu who's buying the yeah, graphene buying in the world right now? Right, right. It's predominantly going into composite materials. So you put it into plastics, you mm. can use less of the plastic. It's in every Ford motor car, every Ford uh, since February 2020. They've been putting it in cars since 2018, but since February 2020, it's in the foam cushion seats. It's in the underhood insulation of every Ford motor vehicle. And it's going much more than that because it lightweights the vehicle. You can use less foam. You can use less insulation because uh, uh, of, of the properties of, of this material. Um, and then the hope is that you start substituting out aluminum with plastic composites that have the graphene in it. The big markets for where you'll be putting graphene are, for example, in cement and concrete. We have shown that you can add 0.1 weight percent and use 30% less concrete. Think about that. Concrete is, the, is, is one of the largest CO2 emitters in the world because you take metal carbonates, you heat them up to 2,000 degrees, and you get metal oxides blowing out CO2 in, in the process, plus heating that furnace uh, to and blowing out a lot of CO2 to heat the furnace. Then you put it on a truck, you add a lot of water to it, and you transport it in a very heavy truck in a very heavy water-saturated form to a location, and you dump it. So that's 8% of all CO2 emissions come by the, 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 the making of concrete every year. And it only and so lasts, it only has a lifetime of like 50 to 100 years at this point too, right? Like it was 
the Roman concretes lasted much longer than the ones that we use today. And so it's, all, it's, it's an extraordinarily expensive material that has a, an absurdly short shelf life. Okay, so so for, first of all, I'm pr I'm impressed that you know that. Number one, <laughs> number two is is that is that uh, we lived in Portland, a, and the oh, bridge okay. conditions in Portland got it, got are it. terrifying. There are all okay. these spindly little stick bridges, and you can see the rust leaking out from them. And you're also on the Cascadia subduction zone, and so you drive around, and you're like, this is this entire city is a death trap. Yeah. And so we spent some time looking into cement <laughs> when we were there. Yeah. So, so, so the thing is exactly what you say, is that it's a 2,500-year-old material. You would think that we would have gotten past it. You'd think that we'd be using something different. 2,500 years. Uh, um, steel, steel is about 2,000 years old. Aluminum is about uh, uh, 150 years old. So it's a much newer material, but 150 years old. My vision, so I still haven't gotten to where the big applications are, but I've gotten diverted. I'll come back. My vision is to, is to replace concrete, replace it mm. with graphene and say a graphene epoxy, a graphene urethane composite, that if we can use large amounts of graphene, can we substitute out roads? Can we make things much lighter weight? And then you just change it slightly and you have an aircraft fuselage. Uh, it, it, it's it's just, just amazing to, to think about this. But if you add 0.1 weight percent to concrete, you use 30% less concrete. Uh, if you add 1% by weight into asphalt, you triple the life of the asphalt road. So think about the amount of money that this would save cities and countries as they, as they make roads. And, and, uh, um, so, and then when you said these things only last 100 to 150 years and the Roman concrete lasted much longer, that's right. And we're just finding out how the Romans did this, uh, how, how they made their concrete last much longer. But in my mind, being an American, 100 to 150 years old is not bad. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take that. Because <laughs> On a four-year <laughs> election cycle, that's about as yeah. far as people think these days. Right. So, so I'll, I'm okay with breaking things down and replacing them every 100, 150 years. You go to Europe or you go to Israel and they want structures to last much longer. Americans don't retain their structures. They just tear it down and build a new one. And, and, uh, um, but but uh, I, I think that, that the, so within a year, we'll have our graphene will be in rubber tires. So uh, 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 it'll, it'll be in commercial rubber tires in, in probably less than a year from now. So the application errors are going to soar now that the price is going to come down. You could never put, afford to put it in concrete at, at $60,000 per ton because concrete's very heavy. You could never have afforded to put it on an asphalt road, but now you're going to be allowed to. It's going into paints, into coatings. Uh, uh, you, you talked about the rust. Corrosion is a huge problem. These make tremendous corrosion resistant uh, films so so it's and and uh, uh, plastics you'll be able to substitute out metals with plastics um, you, you can put it in metals and enhance the metals or you can substitute out metals with plastics which lightweights things that for any, every mobile application is going to be tremendous and you say oh this is going to be really bad this is going to be the next asbestos this has been checked out so in the whole area of nano we, we check these things out very early on it's not like multi-wall carbon nanotubes that are too long for the macrophages to wrap up so that when they get in your lungs, it becomes like asbestos. No, even single-wall nanotubes can be wrapped up by the macrophages and then you just cough, it, it brings it up, you cough it out. Uh, uh, but graphene is supple, it, it gets wrapped up. Graphene has been in our world. That's why I say people have been drinking graphene. It's part, been part of our world. So it's not like we're introducing a foreign material here. This, this, is, this is the beautiful thing about it. And, and it's, it's conductive. And it's transparent at, at, at uh, uh, just a few sheets. One sheet is only absorbs 2.3% visible light at 500 nanometers, which is the middle of the visible spectrum. So you can make these conductive films. And uh, uh, so it, it, it has all these amazing problems. And then heat transfer is, is just amazing on this, to be able to pull heat out of structures with graphene. Mm. So um, to be able to make it now cheaply, um, that is a big, big boost. So that, that's another thing. We came up with this flash dual heating process to make graphene. Discovered in 2018, first published 2020, 
and and the company is just soaring on this thing, uh, uh, working to scale it up. Has this been a slow realization for you over the course of your career, or is this something that you saw at some point and you just saw the entire future spread out before you of what could be? What it, what's the process been like for you of coming into these realizations? What's what's the idea? What does it feel like to have these ideas, and when did those occur to you? Okay, so so I, I, I'm not done. You you asked me about about what what we're working on the topics. I mean, it, this is like like if you asked me about my children and I only described one of them and I have three others. I mean, I have so many others and, and, and you're changing topic, but I, I don't mind. I change the topic. I've, I've started 13 companies in the past, since in the past eight years, since 2015, we used to license out a lot of technologies to big companies and we made nano dollars in the process. It's very hard to make money this way that goes in and, and, and people have a short attention span in industry. And they, so the only way to really do this is you've got to start a company and, and build around this thing and then do joint ventures with big companies to, to get these things spun out. But no, uh, um, we did more mundane things, I think, in the past, and then other things that I thought would be very big, but I didn't have a very good gauge on it. After being in this field for 35 years and, and, uh, um, and having in, in 2000, I started a company or 99, I started a company called Molecular Electronics Corp. Where, and, and I started with five other professors and, and we were going to make electronic memory that, that uh, uh, needed no moving parts. So we were going to replace the hard drive and it would be non-volatile memory for a computer. Nobody knew in 1999 that flash memory just by making a deep trench capacitor on your typical CMOS transistor would allow you to have flash memory and you'd have no moving parts and electronic memory. So we had no, no idea that that was coming online, but that was the idea. And so I learned everything not to do with that company by driving $9 million into the ground, by losing a lot of friends and family and, and, uh, um, and, and becoming crosswise with all these wonderful professors that I had worked with just fine for many years. So now I no longer start companies with other professors unless I want to destroy the relationship. I, I never raise money from friends or family. If friends or family beg me to want to come in, I say, look, I have nothing to do with this. Here's the CEO. You're on your own on this one. And, and uh, because, because uh, uh, when you drive $9 million into the ground, you have nowhere to go for the holidays. <laughs> you don't have much, many friends or family yeah. left. And, and, um, so, so what we did is, 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 uh, um, so now I have a much better sense when we discover something, I know whether that's going to be just an academic publication or that's going to be an academic publication plus a big advance because I've been in this area so long, because what happens is professors, professors see a blip on an oscilloscope and they'll say, oh, look at that. You know how much money I can make from that? And I'm like, nothing, uh, like, nothing, nothing. Yeah. You cannot put that blip on the oscilloscope in a box and sell it to somebody. It will make you nothing. Yeah. Until you learn how to package that thing and get through this valley of death and make it at scale, and it really is not an incremental. It doesn't make something 10% better. You've got to be tenfold better in order to break into this. Only then. And, and so I have a much better sense for that. And what's happened is I've been able to make friends with investors that have made a lot of money. And so what happens is whenever I bring to them now something, they don't send to me 25-year-old analysts who have learned for 15 minutes on Google about this topic to question me on how I'll be able to make money on this. They trust me. I say, this is going to make a lot of money. This is a good one. That's it. They'll take it. They'll invest it just based on my word. So that's streamlined it a lot for me. But that's being a professor for 35 years has allowed this because I've worked in, across so many different areas and seen so many different technologies. And that's a beautiful thing about working in the area of na nanotechnology. Even though I'm a, a trained synthetic organic chemist, working in this area of nano, I have a, a computer memory company. I, I uh, um, have drug companies, materials companies. So I've worked across all these different areas and, and work with biologists, with physicians, 
with electrical engineers, with device physicists, with material scientists. So nano has allowed us to all speak the same language. Before, we never spoke the same language. I, I, would, I would talk about a polaron. They talk about a phonon. It's the same thing. And, and, and uh, uh, I'm sorry, a, a vi molecular vibration. And, and they talk about a polaron. I talk about a radical cation. Same terms. Same phenomena, different terms. And so we were just speaking past each other. But as soon as I learned their language and they learned mine, and that's what nanotechnology really did. It, it, it allowed us to learn each other's language. That, that when I think of a molecular vibration and they're talking about a phonon, now I know what they're talking about. And, and uh, uh, we view it slightly differently, but that's okay. It's the same phenomenon. Then, then I could see across these different bridges because, because uh, uh, this has been analyzed. There was a, th this has been analyzed in industry before. Uh, there, there was a... Um, a gentleman named Otterkirk at, at 3M Corporation. He won the Innovator of the Year Award the same year that I won the, the Scientist of the Year Award from R&D Magazine. And so we met at this event. He worked at, at 3M. And this is a very interesting thing. If you find this fascinating, is that, is that they did a study on the people who worked at 3M and how much money each individual made for the company over their career. And they compared it to the amount of money they invested in them over their career. And how can you calculate how much money somebody's made you, for you? And what they did is they said, how much did this person contribute to these, these uh, uh, patent claims? And how much do these particular claims make for us? So that's how they, they got their metric. And the average scientist at, at 3M made $5 for every dollar invested in them in their salary, benefits, everything. $5 for the company. So this is this bell curve. The, 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 the sweet spot was $5. But there were some people out here that were making $500 for every dollar invested in them. So you hire one of these people and it's equivalent to hiring 100 of these other people. What's with these people out here? What's special about them? So they studied these people. And they turned out to be T, T people, T people. And this is how they called it, is that, is that they are very deeply trained. This is the, the vertical axis, very deeply trained in something. PhD in, in, in a hard science or engineering, but extremely broad in their ability to talk across fields. Mm. Very deeply trained but extremely broad in being able to speak across. Because if people tell me they're, they're, they're nanotechnologists, I'm like, I, I don't know what that means. What, what do you really know how to do? You need, that, you need that vertical piece. You can't just be up here and, and I'm a nanotechnologist. You got to be trained in something very deeply. This gives you a fundamental. And then learning how to speak from biology to electronics to materials and all these different things all the way across... That and that's what every one of these people had. So that's what you want to shoot for, and and being thirty five years in an area allows you to have a, a breadth of, of, of data to think about and say, wow, if they knew this in that field, it's going to have a tremendous advance. And so you take things from one field, and we do this all the time. We were making nanoparticles for downhole sensing, and then we ended up using it. And it's a drug in one of my drug companies because we, we ended up applying it to a totally different area. And so you take things from one area and you see it into another area. And what happens is people have never seen this technology in their area. They're like, how did you think of this? And they just don't know that this is commonplace over here. You just didn't know about it. Like when we made little molecular switching devices, they'd say, how, how many of those did you make? I said, uh, 10 to the 23rd. 10 to the 23rd. How do you make 10 to the 23rd devices? Each device is a molecule. How do you know they're all the same? Because I know, I know they're all the same because I did spectroscopy on it. You, you get, and, and uh, um, it, it took, it took uh, uh, from the dawn of the Silicon era, 1960, it took until about the year 2000 to, uh, to make one mole, six times 10 to the 23rd transistors. We do that all the time with molecules in the lab. So, so single entities, I mean, chemists can make more of single entities than anybody, hands down. 
And so you take that and you enter into the field of electronics now and it's like, wow, now, now I just have to access them. Because if, if, if I had a liter of water and I could program into each one of those molecules in that liter of water, a bit of information, I could have all the information in humankind for the last 5,000 years, every bit of information that was in somebody's brain, I could program into that liter of water if I could put one bit of information into each one of those water molecules. You have to but have a pretty I just good have to access it. You'd have to have a pretty good lattice though, right? Because if yeah. you, you'd have an information soup if you weren't careful there. Exactly. It's, it's access. It's an access problem. But it, 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 it's, it's not having a materials problem. It's not the entity problem. And th this, is, this, is, this is why when, when Jesus said, whatever a man speaks, every careless word that a man speaks, he shall render account for in the day of judgment. Mm. I'm going I'm I'm to remember that one. That one's going to come in handy later. <laughs> yes, yes. That's so true, and, though. Yeah. That's so true. You, yeah. You, you know, it's very difficult to control your speech and it's the simplest way to get yourself in order at the same time yeah wise words yeah. jesus and 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 it's and it's could it all be recorded it's recorded in the cloud i mean the amount of material that you need to record information that's why i remember in 1999 when we were doing this molecular we were thinking could you imagine if we could record every keystroke on a computer and everything is always and now we do this no problem Every key, this is nothing. This is nothing. And, and, and I'm just looking back 25 years. And, and uh, 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 what seemed amazing 25 years ago is commonplace today. So anyway, I think I drifted off I mean, topic. you said a couple of things that are really, really important to bigger discussions that we've been having at this program. One of them, one of them you just touched on about people having this ability to talk across disciplines seems to be actually a pretty big problem in fundamental science where... A lot of insight can come from the outside, but it's difficult to change the minds of people involved. Like my own experience with this was that I was in a biophysics lab and I was doing very physical research. And I had this, well, with my team, we had this insight into the way that a, bi a particular biological process could be happening using physical mechanisms. So not traditional receptor ligand canonical pathways, but there's a physical solution to this signaling conundrum that had been plaguing this particular aspect of biology for 100 years. And I went and gave a talk in London about it. And people were kind of like, yeah, that's cool. But they weren't able to probe it because they didn't have access to the methods that we were using. And so they can't really do much with that information because they, there's no mutants for them to make. There's no PCR reactions to run. And so this, this sort of siloing of expertise makes it very difficult for someone outside of a discipline, even with a brilliant idea, to make waves in that discipline. And, and I wonder Precisely. how we can bridge that better in the sciences because there doesn't seem to be much room for that kind of uh, like in a corporation like 3M, it makes sense that all of the arms would be very interested in listening to one another, but it doesn't seem to be always the case in fundamental sciences. Well, in industry, they get siloed too. But what, what you do is as a research advisor, you pull from everybody. So I'm an organic chemist. I hire very few organic chemistry postdocs. I hire material scientists. I, I hire applied physicists. Uh, I uh, um, applier, uh, 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 hire people with an inorganic chemistry background because I want to bring in expertise. And then I keep around old guys. Those old guys that normally would have retired, guys are retiring. I'm like, how about, how about you just stay on with me? I'll give you an office. Just stay on with me. We, we just want to tap in. These guys have so much information and so much knowledge from the past. And they're like, oh, you know, I, I, you know, we used to do that and we used to have this type of filament, all of these, this, this wealth of information. So what happens in industry, they just get retired and put out. And I try to get these guys. And so what I can do is I surround myself with people that know all sorts of stuff that I don't know. Mm. And it makes me look really smart. That's so smart because I find that on our show in general, the people that are willing to push the boundaries the most are sometimes these really old men. 
right? Because they've been through it all before and they're not really afraid of saying something because they've already had their tenured position or whatever. They've already been through their career. They published their science papers and everything. And now they're, they're willing to sit back and look at this, the entire landscape and say what needs to be said sometimes. Uh, not only that, yeah. but I think that they've spent their lives encountering things that don't make sense. And so by the time that they get towards, you know, later in their careers, there's a lot of time to be able to sit around and say, well, hold on a second. That didn't make sense. And that didn't make sense. And that didn't make sense. And I think that if you change these parameters of the model that we're using right now to look at these things, all of a sudden that they will make sense. And that's terrifying for people because it usually requires changing fundamental aspects of models that have been in use for a really long time. And so I feel like those guys aren't particularly popular inside of academia in certain circles either. It, sometimes their fundamentals are much better than the new students. I mean, be, because they grew up with a slide rule. I mean, the, the, so recently, so, so we're scaling up the flash jewel heating. We are enlisting guys who come out of the oil field who have been jerry-rigging things for decades and making it work and bringing energy into the United States in an amazing way and figuring out how to frack and, and change the whole energy landscape. They're all retiring. We bring them in. Help us to scale this process. You know, you, you try to find a high-voltage engineer in the United States graduating in high... Nobody wants to do high-voltage. They always want low-voltage and low currents. And try high... It's all the old guys that know the high voltage engineering stuff. You hire them and, and, and uh, an old spectroscopist. I mean, you see these little bumps in your spectrum and you think it's a, it's a bunch of nonsense. They know what every one of those peaks means in their, in their, they have all that information in their brain. Oh yeah. That's the J2 stretch. This, I mean, this is the L, this is the J. How do you know that? Mm. I mean, because they cut their teeth on this stuff. And so, um, uh, and, and, and so these are just absolute treasures and I like to extract from them as much as I can before they die. Oh, I, I also, oh, that reminds me also, I loved what you said about, uh, it not being enough to have a good idea. And I think that, I think that this is one of the most misunderstood concepts in all of science. Like people will contact us all the time. We get emails every day by somebody who has this brilliant theory of something, you know, whether it's physics or nature, whatever. And usually we'll, we'll write them back and be like, okay, here's what you need to do to develop the idea. And oftentimes the response is no, like I shouldn't have to develop it. You do it for me because it's, you know, it's, I had the idea and it's like that. I don't think that people understand that, that the really illustrious scientists are the ones who not just had the ideas. Maybe they didn't even have the idea. Maybe they just saw some ideas out there and really took them to the next level, made them implementable, made them believable, understood them, interrogated them from every angle. You know, there's so much to this business that has nothing to do with just having smart ideas. It's, it's just really wild how that, that's gotten lost in the mythology of science somehow. If you think people write to you, imagine how many people write to me. I can't even imagine. <laughs> their ideas. And they're like... They, they'll say, look, uh, I'm only going to share this with you because I trust you. Right. And, and, uh, and it's, it's this idea. And I'm like, um, I don't really work in there, but you, 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 you could take this and you could make it work. I'll, I'll share this idea with you. I'll, I'll share whatever we make. I said, look, you don't understand how the system works. I have graduate students working in my lab. They're working on projects that are funded. I can't just say, stop. Somebody just contacted me with a really bright idea. I want you to stop your PhD right now and start working on this. If I want to explore an idea, I have to raise money for it. I have to hire people to do it. And plus, I don't work in that area. So it would take me a decade to learn that area to begin to work on this thing. And I don't have too many decades left in my life. I, mean, I got to be careful what I do. And so I get contacted all the time. And people are very upset with me because I didn't share the excitement of this idea. And I'm just like, I just can't capitalize on this thing. And plus, I don't like taking somebody else's idea and just bringing that to fruition. And most of them are not well thought out. But, but the joy is, is, is that we come up with things ourselves, that I don't work in industry where somebody tells me what to do. I find something interesting myself and I take it and I run with it. Mm. That's the joy of it. And I surround myself with all these smart 
smart people. And then the young people, is their, their neurons are firing so quickly. So you have the old people with this wealth of information, and then you surround yourself with these young people. When you Just watch, just watch a, a, a 23-year-old go down the steps. And I used to be able to go down steps like that. Now, now I'm looking for a banister. You, you, take, you take an old person, write a check, and it's like, would you write that check already? Just write it. And, and it takes them forever just to write the check. They weren't always like that. And, and, and when, they're, when they're in their 20s, their neurons are firing so quickly. So I'm going to capitalize on these young people. And that's why I tell them in group meeting, I don't want you guys looking at your smartphones. I don't want you, you, you folks sitting around. On, I want you watching what we're talking about here because I need your brains. I need your contribution. Somebody, one of you is going to think of something that we have to do to solve this problem. I want you to really think about this problem. Put down your smartphone and think about this problem and we're going to come up with a solution. Because when you have that many neurons firing that are young, I mean, you get a lot of ideas. And this is why the flash jewel heating wasn't my idea. It wasn't. My student thought of this. Hmm. And, and it's, it's an amazing field. I mean, it, they, they think of this. We package it up. They're the first author. I'm the last author. And people remember it for me. And not from my student. And I say, this was not my student. I'm sorry, I say, this was not me. This was my student. And then they think I'm all the more magnanimous because I'm <laughs> giving the credit to my student. But for me, I really mean it. So many times they come up with the ideas. And, and what happens is they find something. And a lot of times they don't realize how valuable it is. Mm. And then I look at it as that, that is a gem right there. You have just tripped over, swerved into a pot of gold. And now we are going to milk this thing for everything we can. Because what we're going to do is we're going to push this thing for several years. In the first few years, we're going to get a lot of high important publications. And then within the first, within three years, other people are going to build this equipment according to what we've spec'd out. And there's going to be 50 groups in China working on this thing. And we're going to move out. Because it's much harder to publish in it now, and, and, and a lot of the good stuff has been done, and then we're going to move out, and we'll find some other new things. And then we're going to open up these fields, and then we're going to move out. But it comes, I mean, I surround myself with the old people, I surround myself with the young people, and I want to just get their, their minds, their brains. It's just amazing. What? How what do you make space for your do students? Like, how do you make space for them to play? That, that was something that I, I had a particularly amazing experience in grad school where when I joined uh -huh. the lab and I, I was given essentially a year to just experiment with the system with no expectations of, of anything in terms of results. Uh, fortunately, had some accidentally, but my advisor was brilliant enough to realize that no matter if you are very carefully experimenting with a system, you're going to find something interesting eventually. And, and then you need to have that space to play with the system. I, I wonder if how you make room for your students to have these discoveries. Because I know there's a lot of labs that don't, yeah. where they just throw you in and they're like, okay, this is what we do. You're going to be working on this model system. You're going to be filling in this piece of the puzzle, and that's it. Yeah. So, so um, a new student, I will often assign them with a more senior student or a postdoc to learn the ropes because they can spend a lot of time floundering. I want them to get their name on a publication. It's not going to be the first author. It's going to be somewhere buried in the middle. But I want you to get the experience. And you spend a year working with this person and learn the ropes. And then I give them more freedom. I give them a credit card and an inspirational talk. And I have no trouble letting them loose. And I'll give them, so people need some parameters. Okay, you're going to work in this area. But if they should find something interesting, I'll let them go off on this thing. Now, if I feel they're going down a rat hole and I see this for week after week, every week, every student, every week, we have two group meetings. One is a big, large general group meeting. We talk about literature and two people present. But the other meeting is, is uh, four and a half hours for me. And I wow. sit there for four and a half hours and they come in in small teams, according to the projects they're working. And I go over their work. They give me an, a, a, an outline of the things they've done that week. Wow. I want to know everything they've done that week. Because if I see them going down some, some useless path for a couple of weeks, I'm like, uh, we got to keep an eye on this thing because I don't want you floundering here. If we're not seeing something in a while, we're, we're going to redirect or we're going to rethink about this thing. 
Or if, uh, if I see they haven't been very productive that week, I might not say anything. But by the next week, if I see, are you sick? Is there something going on in your life? Because my students graduate within about four years. Yeah. I don't keep them for six, seven years. Nice. But I push them hard. And I expect, but I'm getting a report from them every week, and I want to look over this. Because, and then in those subgroup meetings, everybody in there is thinking about this. I need everybody thinking about wh- what they've just presented. Why are we stuck here? And and uh, so that that that's kind of how I do it. That's incredible. I, I don't think that many advisors are putting that level of considered input into their students. I mean, in my lab in particular. I definitely spent that amount of time with my advisor every week, but I ma- I had to make it happen, right? I had to wait outside of his office, you know, show up when, I, you know, catch the guy when he's coming and leaving the building and really, and the people who weren't doing that didn't really make it, you know, they just kind of fell away. Yeah, yeah I right. also, I also encountered a lot of groups where the idea was not that students were going to graduate in four years. It was the idea that students were there to work for five, six, seven, eight, ten years, because that's, uh, it's easier to maintain the stock of employees that you've already trained without necessarily having to constantly be retraining. And I think that it was, there was just a lot of people who got trapped in this kind of treadmill where it seemed like there wasn't a forward momentum that was available to their projects. And I saw a lot of tragedy in grad school. A lot of tragedy. I see it all the time. I see it all the time. I, you, you know, whatever a man sows, that he shall also reap. If I sow good seed and graduate a lot of good students, I'm going to get a lot of good students. Yes, there's some retraining involved, but I want fresh eyes, fresh fresh minds on this thing. And what happens is you, you, you can see this pattern in graduate students. By their fourth year, they're becoming more cynical. Oh, I, I, I could do that. I, I mean, <laughs> I could do what my advisor does. He just sits in front of his computer all day and it, and, and <laughs> okay, it's time to move on. It's, it's like when you raise kids, you know, you, know, you have this little child and you think, I'm never going to be able to give you up. You're just so sweet, so wonderful. Then something called adolescence comes. You're like, you know, it's not going to be so hard to get rid of you. <laughs> you know? I'm kind of looking for the day when you leave for college. I mean, <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and you see that in graduate students. Too. Okay, there's a time for them to graduate because they become know-it-alls and they're cocky, and they got this thing. Okay, it's time for you to go into another group where you're the low person on the totem pole, and, and you're going to have to start over again and, and learn this thing, and we'll get some fresh eyes on this thing. So I really try to get them out in four years, and, and, uh, and, I, and I threaten them. You know, I say, you, you know I, if, if after four and a half years you're not out of here, you're paying your own salary. Mm. Uh, uh, and I really push them. And, and I will work very hard reviewing their manuscripts and getting them out the door. We publish a lot, and I want to help them get their manuscripts out the door and, and uh, get on to the next one and the next one and the next one. And you can't have two manuscripts until you've had one. So we've just got to get that first one out, and then we'll work on the second one. So that's kind of how we do it. Have you always been so high in executive function, or is that something that you had to learn over the course of your life? I've always been high energy, high strung. Um, uh, um, well, executive function is something that's not necessarily about anxiety or or sort of high stringedness. It's more about the fact that you're able to look at a problem, break it down to its component parts, line up how you're supposed to do the component parts, and work your way through them before your attention or enthusiasm flags. Well, I'm I, I, I'm not sure. I have taken I have taken leadership courses through the church, uh, leadership courses that have helped me a lot on how to deal with people, on how to respond to people, on how to encourage them, on how to motivate them. For example, recognizing the leader, the leaders among them. Who are the one or two leaders in the group that when you say something, everybody looks at that person to see what their response is going to be to this new thing that I've just thrown out there. I want to win that person because when I win that person, They've got other followers, and and uh, um, I make that person more of my friend. And uh, uh, so, so th- these are things that I've learned in the church. I teach big Bible studies with lots of people, always coordinating people, and 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 people don't even see this. But if you look at the life of Jesus, he was amazing. He, he's going to feed five thousand people. How do you feed five thousand people? Well, number one, he could just amazingly multiply fish and bread. 
he didn't just do that. It, it, it would be a free-for-all. So what he did is he said, you have them sit down in groups of 50. I want you to have them sit down in groups of 50. And then you break these up, and then you have leaders from each of those groups, and you, 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 this is how you're going to distribute the food. So he tells the 12 exactly how to do this. This is how you're going to do it. So he's there, and he's just pulling out of this basket these, the, the, these, this, this bread and these fish, and then these people are distributing it. But to just be able to say, I want everybody to sit down in groups, groups of about 50, and this is how we're going to handle 5,000 people. These amazing things that you learn about coordination, how Moses set up the whole leadership structure for these millions of people wandering through the desert. How did he set this thing up? It wasn't a free-for-all. So I, I try to watch and learn from these things, mm -hmm. and I extract from these other areas of my life to try to help me. But I've not always been good at this, and I'm not saying that I'm even particularly good at it now. I, I might be the best person at it in my research group. That's about it. Interesting. Yeah, it makes sense to me that these basic principles would be codified in ancient knowledge Yes. Because humans have been dealing with them since forever, I'm sure. So this That's lets exactly us get right. back to a question that I had at the beginning of this conversation, where you were saying that you you have a, a literalist perspective on the story of the Bible. Yes. And I wonder why the literalist perspective is necessary. Because I grew up in an atheist environment, child of Soviets. I was born in the Soviet Union just before it collapsed. And we're Jewish in the sense that we've lit candles over the course of my life for, for Shabbos, but it, not something that was visceral. And I always saw myself as being someone who didn't believe in God and with a moral code that was very uh, deliberate but agnostic. And over the course of my life, I started to realize that ancient stories that resonate with us are important. They contain truths that are applicable to life, applicable to wisdom. And so I, I've come to understand the wisdom of these stories, but I don't have to have a literalist perspective on them. And so I wonder why, for you, the literalism of it is important as opposed to just being able to look at it as a parable that's informative somehow. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good question and a fair question. So I grew up as a secular Jew. And, and uh, um, my parents were immigrants. And I remember a 30-second conversation in my home about God once between my sister and my father. And she said to my father, so you, you, don't, you don't believe in God. And he said, who said I don't believe in God? I believe in God. That was it. We never talked about God. We never talked about sin. So, so uh, I was in a synagogue once or twice a year. And uh, um, so quite secular in my perspective. When I was 18, something happened. And, and uh, um, I was in a laundry room with a guy, first load of laundry I ever did was in college, age of 18, August. So it was like <laughs> the end of August. And my mother always did my laundry for me before that. And I was figuring out how to do my laundry and work one of these machines. And there was another guy in there and we got to talking and I said, what do you want to do when you graduate? Because he, he was on the football team and, and I said, you're going to play pro ball when you graduate? He said, oh no, I'm not good enough for that. I said, what are you going to do? He said, I'll probably lay ministry. I, said, I don't know what lay ministry is. He said, oh, probably like a missionary. Missionary? Why would you want to be a missionary? I thought all missionaries were dead. I thought <laughs> Indians, the American Indians killed them all. What, what do you mean missionary? Why, why do you even have to be a missionary? Just, we have TV. This is 1977. Uh, just, just TV. And uh, he said, can I share with you an illustration of the gospel? And he was an art major. And I, so I thought he was going to draw a picture. And he essentially did. He drew out on a piece of paper and he put man on one side, God on the other, this chasm between them. And he said, sin separates it. I said, look, I'm not a sinner. I never felt like a sinner. And then he had me read this verse from the Bible. It says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I said, look, I'm not a sinner. And I know why I said that, because in the typical secular Jewish context, little things are not sin. I said, I never robbed a bank. I never killed anybody. How can I be a sinner? And then he turned to a verse and Jesus said, 
In Matthew 5, 28, Jesus said, Everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. I mean, I was 18. I couldn't look at a woman any other way. It's the only way I knew. And, and I knew adultery was wrong. I mean, that was one of the Ten Commandments. And, and, uh, and, and so, so um, this is the first instance that I thought, could I be a sinner? And why should I even care what this guy Jesus said? Why should I even care? I mean, the rabbis told, told us that Jesus was the first Christian. I didn't know Jesus was Jewish. Did you know Jesus was Jewish? Probably you know, but I didn't know. I thought he was Christian. I mean, who knew? And, and uh, why should I even care? But it's that amazing. That was always a point of pride in my family. I don't know if it's because, uh, because we're a family that's both Jewish and technically from a Christian background, that uh-huh. it was always a point of pride that, Jewish, that Jesus was Jewish. Yes. So I, I, I had no idea. But it's amazing how profound his words are. Uh, 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 did that like make sense were, to you see. immediately? Like, did it make sense to you why that was the case? Like, that 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 sense of lust was problematic. Like, why why is that inherently? What a problem? modern term to okay. bring into the discussion. Yeah, I'm just yeah. Pe- viewing this from a purely rational perspective. It makes sense to me why, if you are, uh, if this lens is constantly visiting you when you're interacting with women, why it would be a problem and why it would hold you back and. Therefore, yeah, good, why it's a sin. Good, good question. All right. Now that you asked, uh, uh, at the age of 14, I started working in a gas station just outside New York City, Hutchinson River Parkway. There was one on the northbound side, one on the southbound side. I worked both sides of the highway, owned by the same guy. My job, clean the bathrooms, clean the parking lots. Friday nights, salesmen would, on their way home would throw away these magazines. And I became addicted to pornography at the age of 14. Mm. I didn't think anybody knew about it. Here I am, 18 years old, deeply addicted to pornography. Mm. When you are addicted, it has a hold on your life in an unusual way. There was no internet in those days. We never had these in my home. If my father had had them, I would have found them. I picked through everything. You know, boys do that. And, and uh, I didn't think anybody knew. In those days, we didn't go around saying, talking about our weaknesses. Uh, nobody said, I'm going to see my therapist today. Never, never. They never would have mentioned that. There was, I forget the guy's name. He was running for the Democrat nomination for president. It came out that he had seen a psychiatrist. Boom, it was over mm. for him. I mean, and, and so we didn't talk about our problems. And all of a sudden I felt exposed. And this was really wearing on me. And, and he went through the presentation of the gospel and, and he talked about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That was in August, November 7th of my freshman year. I'm all alone in my room. I had met Christians and I had, they seemed like fine people, but I was all alone. And I got down on my knees and I said, Lord, forgive me because I am a sinner. And all of a sudden I felt this enormous forgiveness start coming over me. And this, this burden of sin just start to lift from me. And then all of a sudden to my right, there was somebody standing. I couldn't see clear with my eyes, three feet away. And I knew this was Jesus. I was already on my knees. My face goes right down to the ground. I'm just weeping. And this love is being poured out. There was no fear. There was no, no, no fear. It's just love like I had never known before. And he wasn't going away. And just, I was weeping. I wasn't saying a word, just weeping. I didn't know what to say. But I felt totally forgiven. No more carrying this sin. I don't even know how long I was there. I got up after a while. I wet my face. I could not stop thinking about Jesus. I was dreaming about this guy, Jesus, in my dreams. In my dreams at night, I was telling people about Jesus, this Jewish kid from New York. If you do not believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ, send me an email and give me a chance to tell you by Zoom why I believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. What am I going to say? I never told anybody. Two weeks later, this guy sees me walking on the floor. He says, Jim, have you received Jesus in your heart? This is the guy who shared with me back in August, this football player. I said, I think I have. Why do you ask? He said, you haven't stopped smiling for weeks. Something's different about you. And I asked him, I said, how can I stay close to God like this? I've never known this before. He said, if you read your Bible every day, you'll stay close to God. If you don't, you won't. He gave me a little green Gideon's New Testament, uh, one of the college editions. I started reading that. 
Now I read from Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 to Revelation chapter 22. When I'm done, I start again. For 45 years, I have read over and over again the Bible, picking up where I left off the day before. I have not missed a day in 45 years. Whoa. And, and uh, um, this to me is my life. I have seen this. I've seen the effects of it in my life. What happened to me that day, boom, I was broken of pornography that day. I didn't even notice it. It's like if your knee is hurting for a week and then it stops hurting, you don't notice it at first. And then you have to, hey, my knee doesn't hurt it. I, no more being drawn into this, never. And when even, even to this day, if something pops up on the computer, boom, and just, just, it just goes, I just delete it away. And, and uh, uh, I had many other problems, but that one, he delivered me from because he used it to show me the problems that I had, and he used it to show me the power of his deliverance, and it was changed. And I was a very shy kid, and I started opening up much more, and and uh, um, just started telling people about the experience that I had, and it changed who I, the type of person that I wanted to marry, the type of job that I wanted to do, how I would interact with people. Things started changing in my life, and I started trying to pattern my life out of the good examples in the Bible. And that's what I did. So to me, it, it, it is, is changed everything. Now, that's diverted off the topic that you wanted, but you asked for it. Well, I think that it couldn't be more important of a topic that doesn't get a lot of play, actually. And I've actually been dying to talk about it on this show, which is I was lucky enough to have come into, like been a teenager essentially before the internet was really a thing. But so internet pornography wasn't really a temptation or something that I, I ever fell into. But I think that something like 90% of men in Western society regularly use pornography. And it's at this point taken as just sort of incidental, like, eh, you know, it's just normal. And I, I often wonder what that's doing to isolate those people from real world experiences and building relationships. I mean, I, I know I sound kind of old talking about this, but I, I also just, I am concerned that it's in some sense behind a lot of the social alienation and isolation that young people are feeling because they're not, they don't have that need to go out and pursue those relationships in the real world as they used to. Or necessarily the robustness to deal with the pain of those relationships going awry. Yeah, because yeah, courtship like, is difficult. With an internet fantasy relationship that you're having for like a few minutes with this pornography, you can just turn it off and walk away from it. You can't do that with your wife, right? You actually have to strengthen yourself and build character and build yourself into somebody that is livable, right? You need to actually make yourself better in order to have a better relationship with your partner. But you don't have to do, deal with any of that if you're having these online fantasy romances. And so it seems like it, it really, it, it has to undermine character development in some sense. And whether you view that as like a, from a religious standpoint or just from a phenomenological standpoint, it's, it seems like there's, it is a crisis in some sense, as far as I can tell. It is a crisis. I mean, and, and you're speaking to somebody who counsels a lot with young married couples. And when one partner brings pornography into that marriage, it's devastating. Uh, it makes the other partner feel objectified. And then you talk to other young people who have no interest in getting married, and you begin to talk with them about this. Say, and why do I even need relationships? I, I, I spend nineteen ninety five a month on this website. I get, I get all the arousal that I need. I can even interact with these women through my webcam, and I get all the arousal that I need. And I don't get any of the mess, and I don't have to spend more than twenty dollars a month. Um, uh, so yeah, yeah, it's absolutely devastating because the words of Scripture are true, and uh, these sages had a lot of wisdom. And you start you start uh, opposing these things. There's going to be problems. I mean, I think you, that you, it's go ahead. the fact that the book is so old and has stuck around for so long. Like we were talking about the idea of seeing something inside of an oscilloscope and then believing that you're going to take that idea and you're going to bring it to the world and everybody's going to fall in love with it. And all of us that have tried to do that recognize how difficult it is to find an idea that is sufficiently resonant with the deepest part of the human mind that they fall in love with it. 
And the fact that these books and these stories have been around for so long, to me, is indicative of them reaching to some deep resonant place that doesn't really change because we don't change. We're not that different from the other animals in the world. Like our animal nature is fundamental. And then we build something on top of it that is a denial of the animal nature eternally. And the stories that let us do that are the stories that stick around because they're the ones that push you forward rather than drag you down, I think. And I think what that that teaching in the Bible is getting at is valid in the modern context just from a phenomenological standpoint that if you are like the entire concept of lust is that you are distracted by something that you can't have fundamentally, right? It's like, you're not actually having this relationship with this person that you're watching on the screen. Or if you're walking down the street, like drawn to like, if you're, if you're objectifying a woman, for instance, you're not ever going to actually have that experience with that woman. So it's a, it's a waste of your attention. It's a waste of your time. It makes the person uncomfortable. It, it leads to this whole cascade of negative events that is really bad for you, ultimately. It's not just like some arbitrary rule that's thrown out there. It's like it's been honed over the ages to the point that it ended up in the Bible because it happens to be true. At least that's the way I see it. No, I, I think you're right. I mean, these, these are powerful things. I... I see this all the time. I deal primarily with educated people. This is just just because this is the world in, in which I work. And every week, every week, I share this story, this story about how I came to the Lord. And every week I see people go from not believing in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ to believing in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ through a one hour conversation, 40 minute conversation with them. And I see their lives changed. I, I, I mean, a big economics professor here in the university a number of years ago, um, he told me that he was, he had picked up the New Testament and he was reading it. He said, this guy, Jesus was not just a normal man. This guy was really special. And I told him, I said, if you keep reading that New Testament, you will become a Christian. You will become a Christian. You cannot read, sincerely read, the New Testament twice without giving your life to the Lord. It's going to happen. And sure enough, he, he, actually, he actually was from Korea. He left the university. He went and he ran for parliament in Korea and he won. And then he came back at one point and he was visiting the university, he stopped in my office, said, Jim, you were right. <laughs> I became a Christian. And uh, uh, these things have a profound effect upon your life. These are amazing stories, but because they're also true, they're historically true. And, and uh, you get to the resurrection of the dead. Why, why is that important, though? I guess I just, I'm not, I don't mean to, I'm not trying to criticize you at all. Like, I, I believe that it is important to you. I can tell it's important to you. But what, like for me, in my own faith and my own understanding, that isn't a huge card in it. And I'm just... Like in the sense that it's possible to look at the parables in the Bible and to arrive at them being the correct moral choice without having to subscribe to the miraculous resurrection. Yeah, like I, I also, I love, I, I listen to the Bible being played, like read. I, I, I was doing that for a couple of years and making my way through it. And I love the stories and they, they're very important stories for sure to me. And I see them play out everywhere, all day, every day. But they're still, to me, just incredible stories. And I don't, I don't I'm just true trying to... True stories. True story. They're true in that they're real. They really do reflect. They're more real than a newspaper article. But I'm still just... I want to understand why the historicity of that is so important to your your project there. And I feel... Right. Uh, and to, to add something, I don't necessarily feel like it's a historicity that's important to just you because I've had plenty of conversations with people where the reality of the resurrection and the figure of Jesus in and of themselves is the key. And I've always wondered why that is so because the story seems so obviously relevant and true without that. Yeah. So you are looking at this and you're seeing these stories and you see the moral value of these stories. And that's certainly there. Whether the stories are fictitious or whether they really happened, the moral value of the story is powerful. I agree. 
But then there's a dimension that goes beyond just the moral value of the story. There is a lordship. There's a lordship that I am bowing my knee to somebody who is real. This is not some fiction. This is somebody who is real, who takes a deep interest in my life, enough to die on the cross for me. This happened. He says, he says that, that God, the Bible says that God demonstrated his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He demonstrated it. When you have a child, you will give your life a hundred times for that child, if you could. It's no longer some fictitious thing that is morally sound. You would physically give your life a hundred times, if you could, for that child. And he says he gives his life for me, and he demonstrates it. This is a person who gave his life for me, who loved me, and interceded on my life. When I bow my knee, I'm not bowing my knee to an idol. I'm not bowing my knee to somebody who's only in my mind. I'm bowing my knee to the creator of the universe. This is a real fundamental human being, and this is a matter of lordship. It's a matter of lordship. It goes beyond just the moral story, which is powerful and important, but it is, goes beyond that. This is my Lord, and I will bow my knee before my risen Savior. And he conquered sin, and he conquered death on the cross. And that's why I know he has the power to aid me in my life. And so when he says, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand, do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will care for you. I will uphold you. Then that has real meaning to me that God himself, the God of the universe, is encouraging me and upholding me. And that's why when I get data sometimes that comes in from my students, I will get on my knees and say, Lord, I don't understand this, but your word says that the darkness and the light are the same to you. You see what I don't see. Lord, show me, I pray thee. Show me, I pray. And he does. He does. So it takes it to a new dimension in the reality that Jesus Christ lives. I have such a secular view of this. Like I have a similar relationship, but it's to the universe and not to the creator of the universe. Well, is there a difference to you? Yeah, I mean, I... It's just, it's just the physical embodiment, right? Yeah, like, I don't know what it is. Because I, I, like, I look at the universe and I recognize the, the relationship that I have to it as being the conspiratorial product of everything in existence to have created my life as it is in this moment. I feel immense obligation to it. I don't think, by the way, I don't think the word fiction is appropriate here if, if we're just trying to, like, steal man... The perspective that did we're I say from. fiction? No, no, we he he's been using the word fiction, like contrasting fiction versus oh, yeah, historicity yeah. or something, because I think that stories are more real than than reality sometimes. Like the meta stories that are that are captured that tell of patterns of behavior and consequence that occur over and over are in some sense more real than an individual instance of those. And so it's not so much that it's a fiction as so much as that it's a very real truth of the universe that yeah. absolutely happens. Like, I feel like Shiloh and I go to church on the weekends, but our church is this river by where we live. And we'll go and we will literally just sit in silence for a couple of hours in the woods. And that to me is a divine, like that is a moment of relating to the divine. And it is a place where questions are answered. It is a place where suddenly the mysterious becomes clear. The, the, the relationship of myself to, to everybody that I know and what I owe them becomes clear. And I've never had the need for there being another character that is part of that because I can look at the universe almost as an actor. Like the, the idea that there is a, uh, that there is something that you are bound to and you owe something to is, has always been central in my life. But something I've bigger than you. Something bigger than me, but I've never had to have a religious, a, like, like a, I, I guess I've never had to have the Holy Trinity present for that to be the case. And I just, I wonder if it's the same thing or not, because I remember Shiloh at some point, I would always be like, I don't believe in God. And Shiloh would listen to me say this stuff. And he's like, I think you might believe in God. 
And I was like, well, there's no, I don't have any of the personification. And I've realized over talking to people over and over again that it's the personification that I just don't feel like I, I, I have or need, maybe even. Okay. Let, 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 let me take you. I mean, you've set this up for me perfectly, <laughs> just perfectly. Let me take you through the gospel according to John chapter one, which is a mirror of Genesis chapter one. He says, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, stop. Think about it. In the beginning. That means before there ever was time. In the beginning was the Word. The Word is information. The Word is, is, is something out there. It's somewhat abstract. In the beginning was the Word. I always took that as the beginning of humans. I always took that as the first moment of being a human was the, because we are the animals that are capable of processing sound in this hyper intellectual fashion that we're able to use these symbolic sounds to communicate expressions and ideas. And I always took that as what standardizes, what makes a human human versus just a chimp or something. You know, we, we have the word. I, I always just took that as the birth of humanity, essentially. Mm -hmm. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So this word was in the beginning, the word was with God, and the word was God. Now, verse 2, he was in the beginning with God. All of a sudden, we put a pronoun on there. We personalize this. He was in the beginning with God. Nothing has come into being, it says, that has come into being that was not made by him. So you are talking about this creation, and I am talking about the one who now who has made this creation. And then, so I, I just gone through the first three verses of John chapter one. Now you go to verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as of the only begotten from the Father. This word, who was God, becomes flesh. So it is not only the creation. Now we have the creator has become flesh. We can touch him. And that's why John says in 1 John, the epistle of John, he says, we held him, we touched him, we heard it, but we also held him. We had him. The word becomes flesh and he dwelt among us. I had these friends in college. They had this fish tank, tropical fish, terrible to take care of tropical fish. I'll never own a tropical fish tank. pH of the water has to be just right. Salinity has to just be just right. Uh, temperature, light, rocks, everything. Special food. Every time he'd go near this fish tank, the fish would swim behind the rocks. And he, he, we said, I wish I could become a fish and just tell them these guys mean you no harm. God is in heaven. He's so hard to get near. He's the creator of the universe. He wants to have a relationship with us. So he himself takes on flesh and dwells among us. If he had come by like some big conquering general, we would have feared him. He says, I will be born among them and I will grow up among them. I will teach them what it's like to have a relationship with God. Now that's how I know I don't have to be like a monk and shave my head and be on a mountain and hum all day. Because Jesus lived among us. He taught us what it's like to relate to the Father, to have a life that is giving to other people. He taught us. God himself came to this earth and taught us. And now we can have fellowship with God, not just his creation that he created, but to the very creator of the universe. I feel like that's what I have in the woods. That's what I feel when I sit down and I look at the trees and I look at the fish and I look at the mosses and the lichens. Like, I don't need a body of Jesus. I'm like, the woods is that. That is the body of God. I mean, I kind of like, I kind of like Jordan Peterson. The mountains, the volcanoes. But, you, know, you know Jordan Peterson, I assume. And I don't know him personally, but yeah, I certainly sorry, know, know of him. Sorry, know of him. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And I like how he put it, which is like very well backed by the literature, which is that you may as well you may as well believe that it is that there is actually a being that is supreme <laughs> because this. if you act as if it is so your life will work out better 
And actually, it seems like people who do have that hard-coded belief are happier. If you look at the literature, this belief in a supreme deity is actually correlated with people's sense of well-being. Which I want to add, I think that is is an experience that I have because it's possible for me to go outside and walk down a street and see everything as being Im- as embodying the the god that I see as the universe and seeing the preciousness of it that I find other people struggle with. But it's not just embodied in the humans, it's also embodied in all of the animals that we live alongside and the trees and the plants and the things that we create. And so it's this thing that is constantly surrounding me. Yeah, I think a really interesting point of discussion might be how you reconcile this with your mechanistic exploration of nature, which is characteristic of the sciences, right? Because in science, of course, you're always trying to come up with these, you know, like I say, these cause and effect relationships, but the purview of religion is outside of that that pure mechanistic understanding, right? Except for perhaps in the origin of life. Mm. So the, let, let me let me just backtrack one, say one thing of, of, about this that, um, you know, for example, Indian six will say something very similar to what you've said. God is in this, God is here, God is here, God is here, God is here. Let me just ask you to ask God, the creator of this whole universe and everything. The Bible says we do not receive because we do not ask. Ask God. Lord, if you are there, if you are beyond this creation, that there is a creator of all of these things that I so enjoy, please reveal yourself to me. That's all I'm asking you to do. Just ask Next time you're in the woods. I've it's, started it's, doing that, actually. I've started. Okay. But I've, I mean, I'm an artist also. I, I write, I do music. I, I've started just asking for these things. I'm like, what should I, what should I be saying? What should I, what should this piece be about? What does this sound like? And I get answers. It's kind of creepy. I mm. actually think that now that I think about it, I did ask this question many years ago, and that's how I came to see it in the woods and in the people. Because I mean, I, this wasn't this isn't a a native dis- disposition for me. I'm like a very gloomy person by nature, a brooder, one could say. But I think that there is the the answer came in that perspective. Okay, now. I- how how I, I, I sort of see this and reconcile this and deal with this in my science. I think it makes my science far more exciting. And I'll give you an example. I was building what we called a synthetic brain. And this was in about the year 2000. It was a DARPA funded project. We called it the synthetic brain. And DARPA said, don't call it that. You're going to get bad press. So we called it a, a, a molecular computer. And then a few years later, they had a synthetic brain project. But at the time, they didn't want us to use that terminology. But it was to take a disordered array of molecules, something where we didn't know the pattern. Because typically, if you have a computer chip, you know where every transistor is. And you know how everyone is wired up. But when we have 10 of the 23rd elements, molecules that could each be a switch in, in, this, in this box, how do we take that disordered array of molecules and program it to be something useful? Not just take it for what it gives. I give an input here and it gives a certain output there, but program it. In other words, give certain inputs here such that it changes the output here so that it gives me the output that I want so that I can now program this. These two inputs high, this comes out low. One is high, one is low. Always comes out low until both of them high, comes out high. So so I can get all my logic gates. And so we had to think a lot about these disordered arrays. I don't know what the interconnect pattern is in my brain, but I use it all the time because it has mapped it. So when a child is born, they'll they'll take food and stick it in their eye and their ear. They haven't yet learned it goes in their mouth. But once it starts training, it learns and for the rest of their life, they'll put the food in the right place. And so, so there's this pattern of learning. And as I was going through this, 
I was trying to visualize the simplest of brains. And I remember I would just sit outside and I would let mosquitoes come and just feast on me. And I just wanted to watch them. Tiny little brain. And they had all of this coordinated flight. And they would sense, so I'm emitting molecules and they're sensing that. So they have these receptors that are sensing that. And then they land and they they do their thing. They sting, they fill themselves with my blood. And then what happens is as soon as they leave, another one will come to that location because he or she has left a train of information embedded in molecules that here's some fresh meat, here's the place to come. And you see all of this. And then I watched my son. He was about three years old at the time. And he came running to me with his hands up. And I said, Lord, how did you do this? How do you build a brain like this? And there's all this coordinating, coordinated motion and this love that he has for me and I have for him. This is my son. How do you do this? And it makes me all the more want to get this thing solved. And it gives me this enormous appreciation for what other people don't have because they're not seeing it in the same context of how amazing this biological creation is. I'm a synthetic chemist. I make molecules for a living. I, these things are so hard to get to work together in a coordinated process. And this is what you do in nano, get these groups of molecules to work together cooperatively. Very, very hard. And biologists miss this all the time. They are blind to this. They're flying over 30,000 feet and they say, oh, look at that. That does it. You don't fly over New York City at 30,000 feet. You go stand in the city. You go underneath that city. You see the infrastructure of what runs that thing. You see how complex it is. This doesn't just happen doesn't just happen this way. And then you I withdraw in horror because you realize that the trains are falling apart and they're still using 100-year-old switches yeah, with yeah, vacuum tubes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's, a, that's another topic. But, but you know, you know this, I look at a, a leaf on a tree and there, there is a, a, a magnesium atom, atom sitting in the middle of a porphyrin that is this funnel for light. Light photons are funneled to hit that. And when they hit that, an electron ejects that travels hundreds of angstroms, this electron, to start the photosynthesis process. Who can see this but the chemist? I look, at, I look at things and I see things that nobody else sees. Anytime I look at a carbohydrate, I look at a potato, I am just thinking of these glucose molecules hooked together in, this, in, 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 in that, that, that white material there and just thinking of the molecular structure and it, it is just amazing how precisely these molecules are hooked together. You try to hook two glucoses together, two. two glu- it is so hard. Six glucoses, six glucoses can hook together over one trillion ways. And only one way is found in that potato. How does that happen? Biologist has no appreciation for that. And then you look at this and you say, this is utterly Utterly amazing. God, you are amazing. So that, that's I, I agree. my world. I agree. But, but at the same time, the job of the scientist to un- is to understand the mechanism of how it does happen, right? Yeah, sure. So, so when we talk sure. about something like fish being multiplied or something in these, in these old stories, yes. do you imagine a mechanism for that? Yeah, it's called a miracle. He has stepped outside of space and time. And so he has gone into a realm that does not work in my realm. What works in my realm is that you have a little fish egg that develops into a fish, which is hugely remarkable, which is the types of things that we as scientists study. How does that happen? But when he starts multiplying fish, then he has stepped out. And then, and then science no longer defines it. By definition, science cannot define a miracle because it is, it is stepped out outside the bounds of science, nor can science tell us that there can be no miraculous, because it is stepped outside the bounds of what science is able to tell us through our observation and sensing. That's so interesting, because I look at life as being miraculous, definitely. Like, I think that it is, the, the potato is a miracle, 
like you said. The is that an is that a flask? <laughs> Yeah, well, it's, it's got a handle on it. So it's, it's sort of flask <laughs> cup. <laughs> I didn't see the handle for a second. I was like, "That is bold." But so I, I guess I like I, look. I think that belaboring the point of the the historicity of the Bible is, I, I think I'm it's, me, it's, it's metaphysics, it. right? Like curious. at some point, it comes down to metaphysics, and from what I can tell, is your metaphysics is that it happened and we accept it and by accepting it it falls outside of the realm of what needs to be explained because there's the scientific but there's also the spiritual and the spiritual cannot be interrogated using the tools of science and i'm not really i don't think that it's particularly useful to to belabor that point that's just a metaphysical that's like a metaphysical one which i'm perfectly happy to grant you because i think that metaphysics are important yes i'm okay and so sounds good to me. <laughs> Delay, yeah, do you have... no, I, it, it's it's totally fine. I just um, I think that it, the metaphysical uh, stance, which is just not even to be argued, is that whether or not you believe that things can occur without mechanism. And it sounds like that that some people believe that that things can happen without mechanism, and some people don't. Some people believe that some things can happen without mechanism, because I would bet that you're pretty mechanistic when it comes to your chemistry work, right? Well, I, I, I don't know that a miracle is without mechanism, mm. but it's a mechanism that I can't explain. So we know, we know that, that 70 to 90% of everything that is around us is dark matter and dark energy. We cannot see it. We cannot detect it. We have no tools to interrogate it, but we know it's there because of difference. Well, there's a lot of we, people who think that it's not actually there and that those are... Well, needless to say, but there's a lot we don't understand. There's a lot that we don't understand. There's a lot that we don't okay. understand. All right. I'll agree with that. Yeah. And, and so, so I don't think I have a mechanism to interrogate, just like I don't have a, a mechanism yet. I think humankind will have a mechanism to interrogate both dark matter energy and dark matter in hundreds of years. Definitely. But 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 that's that's just just my opinion. I, I have no basis on which to know that other than the fact that people if you asked a person in seventeen hundred, will we ever will people ever land on the moon, it'd be like, uh, uh nobody can jump that high. It was you know, you we don't even have flight yet. I mean so so there's lots of things that people are going to come up with, but I don't have a mechanism to probe that sort of thing. And so we call it the miraculous, but I'm not sure that it's without mechanism. Everything in this physical world and in everything I do has a mechanism. Right. And that's a lot of what we probe. We probe mechanisms and, and, and sometimes we get it right and sometimes we get it wrong. And then when we get it wrong, people correct us. And then science is self-correcting in that way. And yeah, science is amazing, but... I don't think that it's a good replacement for spirituality. Like, it can only handle certain things, right? It's very good with physical systems and with, especially with development of technologies, but it can't really guide us in terms of the decisions we make. And so I, you know, I spend half my life working on science, but I spend the other half working on art and, and writing and poetry and music because I think those are equally valid ways of studying the universe which have nothing to do with mechanistic understanding. And I think that that's what's so beguiling and difficult about this question, because if you look at chemistry and physics, it's very easy to look at them from the perspective of um, there are objects and the objects are doing stuff and we can interrogate this with the tool of science. No problem. We're going to get to the bottom of it. We'll understand. But when you look at biology, you start to introduce other aspects that have a spiritual component. And that is almost impossible to treat as being simply material because you will never get to any of the right answers. And so biology is a particularly weird science because it starts from the origin right? If you study life, you have to ask the question, okay, well, where does it come from? Because where it comes from is going to inform you about the nature of where it's going, where it's going and what it is that you're studying. Like if you have no idea where something comes from or how an element gets made or how a compound is formed, are you really going to be able to say that much about it? 
Probably not. Like you have to understand where life comes from in order to really be able to say much about biology. And this was something that I struggled with deeply when I was writing my thesis, because I was like, how do I write a thesis about microbiology if I can't explain where life comes from? And nobody can. Right. So that's I, I feel like that's, Dr. Tour, where you kind of operate, which is that it's a field that has a component to it that cannot be purely materialistic. Well, I, I, I just, just want the viewers to know that I did not pay you to say anything that you just said. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome to send us a check. But no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. And, and, and uh, you know, as a scientist talking about origin of life, I have continued to maintain that I think that one day we will understand where life came from. Mm. And the second that I stop saying that, people will say, ah, Tour's God of the gaps. We can dismiss him. I think that we will have an understanding of where life came from, how it happened. All I can maintain today is that we are clueless. And I continue to work, use that word clueless. People will make one compound, they'll make another compound that have very little relation to what would be available on an early earth. I know what molecules do and what they don't do by themselves. Everything has enormous uh, 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 user interaction to have this happen and then to polymerize them into structures. And now if you had them all, what are you going to do? I have asked key origin of life researchers this question. Okay. We can get all the compounds needed for life. We can get not just the small molecules, not just the sugar, not just the amino acid. We can get the polypeptides. We can get the polysaccharides. We can get the lipids and, and uh, uh, we can get the nucleic acids. We can take them all from living cells. If I gave you all of those components, all of the components found in a cell, could you reconstruct a living cell? And most of them in front of a crowd like to not answer that question. And when you get them privately, they confess, there's no way. We have no idea how to put these. Two. So even if we had all the components, we have no idea. That's why we're clueless, because we don't know how to polymerize these things to make the stru structures that I just mentioned, nor can we, we can, can we put them together to do what they need to do. So you take all of these components and you throw them inside a, a vesicle, They'll do nothing. They'll do nothing. They'll absolutely decompose. People say, well, you have RNA in there. So what? That RNA won't last. Because if RNA, say RNA has a half-life, say of 100 days. Say you, uh, RNA has a half-life of 100 days. That's an you optimistic half-life for that's RNA. That's an optimistic half-life. I'm being very generous, <laughs> yes. You have one molecule, one molecule, not a mole of molecules, one. Now you have to take that half-life and convert it into a probability. That probability now, if, it, if, if, if the half-life of, of uh, one of these linkages is 100 days and you have a 300 mer, then you take 100 divided by 300, that 100 days now turns out to be eight hours. You have eight hours, good luck, with that one molecule of RNA that is all of a sudden going to find all the other amino acids that it now needs to start putting something together and all the other infrastructure before it's gone. This thing, this is why we are utterly clueless. We are clueless on this. Okay, so my first question is, uh, what is your definition for life? And I, so, I so, hope that you're not oh, going to oh, give okay. me, I hope you're not going to give me a list of six things that life does. Right. All we have is the characteristics of life. I'm not going to give you the characteristics of life that we have. Life is very hard to explain so that that is a question, what is it that we have just lost? When a cell dies, this is the other question that I ask, ask biochemists. All right, I have a cell. The cell has just died. You want it to necrose, you want it to apoptose, however you want it to die. The cell has just died. What is it we just lost? You lost, the ability, you lost the ability to accomplish a goal. Okay. Your goals specifically. The life's goals. Is that the, what you mean? Well, the life. The what? The life. What have we lost? We have lost a unit of matter that was able to act towards its goals, and now it can no longer. It w It was. It went from a a vo very low entropy state, very high energy 
low entropy, which is unusual, not unheard of, but unusual, very high, high energy, low entropy. And now all of a sudden, the entropy has increased enormously and the energy has decreased enormously. Mm. Okay. It, that is fantastic. And, and, that is fantastic. High entropy state. That is, okay. So check it out. I don't think that life is an object. I think that life is a state of matter. And I think that when you start thinking about life as a state of matter, then these questions start to become slightly clearer. And I think that we can't possibly get to the origin of life until we start thinking about what is life in a way that doesn't just describe what a cell does. And I think that this high entropy environment, which is inside the cell, because you say that, and very, I'm like... Very, very low entropy. Sorry, low entropy. I'm sorry. Um, so High energy, low entropy. What I meant is highly structured, because you say low yes. entropy, and I think of a crystal. I think of a lattice. I think of something that's highly organized in repeating patterns. Yes, so, so, so it, 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 it's, it's extremely organized. Yes. Okay, yes. so what life does is it takes the... It takes things and passes them across this lattice and creates disorder, right? Because the output of life is disorder. You're taking things that are complex, you're breaking them down by passing them over your lattice into making the subunits that the original thing was part of. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm not sure that I can go there because the cell is like a factory making this... It, there's so many pieces that it's making that are highly ordered it in is. order for its operation. It is. But so like we have to we have to think like if we're thinking about origin, we have to think about the the heart of the principles that drive the cell. And so the cell is at this point a really goal oriented, a really effective goal oriented object. Right? So it's like it has a desire, which is the fact that I want to go eat. I want to go eat things that will feel good. I need to be able to throw my garbage out somewhere where it's to, not going to kill me. See, you would get, I would get in trouble if I just said what you said. If I said it has a desire. I know, but that, that's stupid. It's like you should be able to say that. That's obviously what life is. Okay, well, you, you, you don't run in the same circles where I get... I'm Come sure on. you don't. I'm sure you, I will. And that's what, that's what I love about this podcast so much is that it's, it's, it's our circle. We get to talk about this this way because this mm. is, these are the questions that we're trying to answer. Do you know who Rod Swenson is by chance? No. Rod Swenson had this really brilliant formulation to define life in a thermodynamic for, framework like you were just describing, where he said, life is that which maximizes entropy production external to itself which I thought was really brilliant. He's got a few lectures about this. I don't know if he's still out there doing the circuit, but the idea that life, in order to pay off all of that order that, that is necessary for a cell, let's say, or a being like us, we have to chew up the environment to an extraordinary extent to balance out the thermodynamic equation. And uh, yeah, it might be something, uh, I, I can send you a paper after we're done, but it's an yeah, interesting it, formulation it, that I think really it, nails it on the head. Mm -hmm. And I think that the implications for it are that you can, we've made the mistake of looking at life as being a cell. And I don't think that that's what life is. I think that that's a form that life takes. And so if we're looking for the origin of cells, that's a different question than the origin of life. Uh, you, you know, I'm not going to argue with that. I'm not going to argue with that because it, it, it's very similar to the brain versus the mind. I mean, there's, there's, there's things that, that become a little bit more abstract when we start talking about these things. Yeah. And so the, I think that a lot of the origin of life research is plagued by this idea that in order to understand life, they have to understand cells. And most of the research is spent figuring out how are we going to assemble a cell? What is the thing that is what is the thing that it's going to look like where we're going to be able to say that we have accomplished what we have on Earth today? But I think that you've criticized before where you point to the complexity inside of a cell and you're like, what the hell are you talking about? Like, how much time do you need in order to be able to achieve this over how many iterations? And you're like, I don't like the idea that people are using time as their mechanism where they say that they have something that's really, really simple, and then you just take some billions of years, and all of a sudden you have something that's not so simple. Mm. We're starting to realize that life on Earth began basically when Earth began. Like, the earliest cells are basically 
the age of the planet. I think that there's like the age of the oldest rocks. The age. Is, this is Shiloh's favorite horse to beat. So would, would you like to beat the horse for a second? No, that's okay. <laughs> um, I do think that there. Uh, one thing that's really interesting to me, by the way, I wonder if you could comment on with regards to the origins of life, is that it assumes that there was an origin at all. I, I mean, I, I, I realize there's only two options here: either life happened, or it's always been there. And uh, I'm curious why you come down on the side that it happened as opposed to have always yeah. had been here. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's simpler uh, because there was an origin to the universe. Mm. And it'd be very hard to have, an, have a cell floating around without a universe. There was an origin to the universe. Are you we speaking of the that... Big Bang Theory or, or metaphysically from your, your I... own? Spiritual. Oh, I, I'm, 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 I'm thinking of from both sides. The Big Bang tells us this, and also the Bible tells us this, that there was an origin to the universe. Uh, uh, so if you want to say that the universe has always been, then things begin to change. But um, both from the Bible and from the Big Bang. And, and, you know, science wasn't always, as you know, on the side of an origin of the universe. It had the steady state theory. And that didn't come collapsing down for sure until 1964 with the advent of with the discovery of, of uh, microwave background radiation. Mm -hmm. Which we should talk about, but I do want to get my, I, I do want to finish the origin of life stuff. We okay. can, I, I really, we should come back to the CMB because as a chemist and a spectroscopist, I have questions for you. Okay, but now I'm not sure I'll be able to answer those. Not questions. about, not about, not about the Big Bang, specific uh, spectral questions, but. Okay. With like, oh, no pressure. <laughs> we, we don't have we don't have to do the CMB today. That's okay. But needless to say, we're skeptical. But anyways, the uh, the thing that you said, Shiloh, which is that okay. Well, what if life is eternal? If if life is to sell as jet stream is to hurricane, then life is eternal. Well, if you include the life of Jesus. The life of God, yes. In the beginning was the word. He was there. God has always been. His life has always been here. Okay, and so if we interpret the scripture as being a, a repository of deep information about something that is, which I think is an accurate way of looking at it. Yeah. I, again, I, I can't accept, I, I, don't, I don't have it in my constitution to accept it literally. But I do think that it says something important, which is that if the animating spirit, right, like it used to be called the elan vital, the soul, the thing that makes stuff go, that's been really, I was going to say poo-pooed, but that sounds very mature. But I think that it's been discredited significantly over the course of the Unpopular. last... Unpopular. It's become really unpopular over the course of the last hundred years or so, right? So nobody talks about like the vital spirit anymore. But I think that that's fundamentally missing something, which is that there must be a different pressure. Or there must be a pressure that organizes matter into cells. And it's that, that pressure that we should be trying to understand. Like we try to understand gravity. We try to understand light. But with life, we have this really stupid way of looking at it, which is that it's cells. And I'm like, that's like being like gravity is planets. Like it doesn't make any sense to me to look at it that way because you, you have will and that's what like I think about death sometimes in the sense of there is a being and then there isn't and exactly that question that you asked what is lost and what is lost is this potential energy of accomplishment because while the organism is functional there is still more to do but the minute that that membrane breaks and apoptosis happens action is done will is done Destiny is done. Uh, desire is done. And it, it's hard to talk about it scientifically, but I think that that's where people really lose it when they're talking about origin of life research. Like we listened to your conversation with, uh, with Farina and it was I'm just... Sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry you had to listen to it. We listened to half of it, let's be, let's <laughs> yeah, be honest. Yeah, it, it, it's it, really it was painful. very difficult to listen to. Yeah, I, I, I haven't even listened to it. I mean, I'm done. <laughs> it's, it was, uh, he was... I'm, I'm I was... Not, I'm not, yeah, I'm not proud of my behavior, but uh, he um, was, you can see I'm passionate. He was so rude. It was it was sad. Yeah, I don't know. I would have liked. I would have rather have seen just a cage fight between you two than <laughs> than a you know, uh, like 
having if both you know if people are respectful a debate can work out i think if if people agree to you know hear the other person out and not to make ad hominems and there's just some basic ground rules for having a debate and it just seems like what's the point if people you know if if that's impossible to achieve yeah can we get past that topic? sorry I appreciate sorry. that i'm sorry so it's my point is that it's a debate that often devolves into people talking past each other. And I think that the reason that people are talking past each other is because we're preoccupied with the question of cells and not with the question of life. Okay, I am not disagreeing with you, but I understand why scientists... Now, you, you might remember when you and I had... When, when the three of us had a discussion about my coming on this podcast, I said, it's hard for me to run in this third dimension when we get past science. So I'm, I'm, I'm not pedaling as fast as you guys here. So, but, but the cell is the simplest life, life form that a scientist can get their hands around. So that is why they study it. But I do not disagree with you that there is life outside of cells. Mm. And this is defined for us in, in the biblical context, which makes me very comfortable that God was long before there was any other life. Mm. Jesus was life indeed. He was there in the beginning. Jesus was not created later on. Jesus always was. He was the life he was the life before there was ever time. Life precedes what happens in a cell. So I agree with you, but I can understand that scientists cannot start there. Well, there's a, and, and cannot go, go there. They have to start with the cell. There's also all this crazy stuff, which is, I don't know how much you know about the way that uh, environmental and metagenomics are done. No, I have no idea. Okay, well, so basically there's, I mean... You know this from working with chemistry, right? Which is that you have to, it's not like you can go and look at a substance and tell what's inside the, the reaction vessel. There's tools that you use and those tools give you output that does not look like a molecular structure. And from that output, you piece together the story of what is actually in the reaction vessel. Yes, but, all the time. That's the only way we do it. Right. And biology mm -hmm. basically at this point works the same way, right? So you, if, let's say you're trying to figure out uh, what is an inside, what's inside of an environmental sample? You're not growing cultures of bacteria to try to find a colony and then characterize it using various physiological assays. What you're doing is you take a scoop of seawater, you isolate all of the genetic material in it, you do deep sequencing, and then you assemble it into what you assume are genomes of organisms. You put those genomes into a database, and then everybody, when they go do their own genome sequencing, will compare their stuff to what's in the database. When you find it enough times, finally it's something that gets named. There's a bunch of orphan sequences. And every single time that somebody looks, they find sequences that have never been found before. Mm -hmm. And that's, a, that's the dark matter of biology, where I feel like our tools that we use to try to understand the origin of life or what life looks like is bordered by the cells that we can grow and the cells that we can look at. And so, if you assume and to that, expand that, the all of the studies on origins of life are bound by their experimental systems, right? And the the necessity of external reagents and all of this, right? Not only that, but usually earth like uh, atmospheric conditions, right? So you can't really recreate a smoker vent at the bottom of the ocean easily inside the laboratory. You can do something that like kind of approximates it, but it'll never be quite right because it's such a it's a complex crystalline system with complex chemistry. And so the point that I'm trying to make here is that I think that origin of life research would advance a tremendous amount if we were able to get tools that allowed us to deconvolve what's happening below the level of the cell, because the level of the cell is too complex of a level to start from. Like, okay, but, but let, let me just mention that many people have carried out the calculations on how simple a cell could be to still do what a cell has to do. The, to but I'm not talking about cells, though. 
right? I'm like, look, a cell is a thing. It's an ontological category that says that it has these seven characteristics. But those seven char- it's a, it's a circular definition, right? You're like, what is life? And it's like, well, it's the thing that can do all of these things. Well, what's the only thing that can do these things? It's a cell. Well, how did we figure, how did we find cells? Or how did we define life? And it was like, oh, well, we defined life by looking at cells. And so... So is, is, is this pre-cell in your, in, in, in your thought process s- simple or a highly complex being? I'm just trying to oh, no, super c- figure simple. out where you're going. Super, super, super simple. Like, I, I, I think that the way that I look okay, at it... T- t- tell me about that. I, I, I know about molecules. Tell me what molecules would make this up, or is it not even made out of atoms... And, and, and assembled into molecules. Is it, in, in your mind, is it made out of, what's it made out of? Is it, is it atoms? Is it molecules? What molecules? That's what I, I'm trying to understand. Okay, well, so the way that I imagine it is I imagine that the rocks of the crust are filled with small pores that contain aqueous solutions of the various building blocks that you need for organic molecules. Okay, the, you, you, the building blocks of organic molecules, or or so, are you talking about amino acids or ammonia? I'm talking about uh, hydrogen, ammonia, carbon dioxide, things okay. that are things that come from the earth, basically. Yeah, the, right, that's the what earth. an early earth was. I got you. Okay, okay so you you got small molecules. Now what? Okay, so this and you got gazillions of these little reaction chambers in the form of these pores. Yeah. Right? So like okay. basically when magma comes out of the earth, it solidifies, it's carrying water. Most of the stuff that comes out of a volcano is water. And so inside you have all of these reaction chambers. And these reaction chambers are patterned because they are crystalline. They're crystal structures. And those crystal structures act as basically as, as proto-enzymes. They're able to stabilize the carbon dioxide and the ammonia so that they can come together under the right conditions and form slightly more complex molecules. You're like the chemist. Sort of in and the so, way that DNA is a template for the transcription of proteins, I think that what you're saying is that... It's technically a template for RNA. RNA. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry. But in the long <laughs> run, essentially, it's a, it's a blueprint, right? And you're saying that the earth itself is a template for the yeah, primordial yeah, cells. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. So, so, so many people have had this idea that you get a chiral surface and that acts as an enzyme. But anytime they've tried to do this with huge amounts of operation to help it, you get essentially junk. You have get they... a, little bit, a little bit of what you want. And, and the, 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 the chiral induction is very small. And, and, I don't know if you remember in the beginning of that debate, I gave him all the small molecules that he wanted. And that, I'll give you all the small molecules. Some, some of these are rained down from space. Now what? Now what? They're, they're generally, they're generally, not, they're generally uh, 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 racemic, but, but even I gave to him all of them in, in, in uh, an antipure form. Now what? Okay. Now, okay. now he just points out a bunch of abstracts, I guess, that are... Yeah, yeah. now what? Okay, so now, now what? what is that at this point we have to ask ourselves if desire is important. Will? Will. There, there, there's, there's, as far as I know, there is no will in a bunch of molecules. Uh, but there are interactions that want to occur. In other words, a, a lone pair wants to attack a carbonyl. So if you want to call that will because one is delta plus, the other is delta minus... If you want to call that will, okay, then there's there's a ton of will out there. Okay. Well, what about crystallization? Crystallization. Okay. So so uh, uh, w- w- what are you saying is crystallizing? The, these these structures are crystallizing. Well, okay? I think that you can look at DNA as a crystal. You can look at proteins as a crystal. You can. But how did you get DNA? Well, I'm you not saying. Have... No, 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 no. I'm not saying the word DNA yet. Don't don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that that we're going to produce a cell inside of this chamber. I'm literally just at the point where I'm, and and I'm not telling you that I have the answer here. Yeah, you are give me, give, you are a give world me, expert yeah. in chemistry, and I have the opportunity to put this in front of you and see what okay. you think. This is not okay. me telling you that I have the answer. This is me okay. telling you like, hey, I have this idea. Do you think that we can push it farther? Okay, all right, go ahead. And so, okay, if you have these chiral surfaces that are able to produce small amounts of chiral molecules inside of individual reaction chambers, right? So you have, you have some kind of proto 
RNA somewhere, you have some like really basic redox protein that's able to buffer stuff. Like glutathione is three amino acids long or four, I think maybe. Do you know glutathione? Yes, yes. Absolutely. Okay. So it's like, and it's, it's really, really vital in a lot of cells because what it does is it, it buffers electrical changes. And the electrical changes, again, I'm not coming at this from a chemistry perspective. No, I, but, I, no it's, it's, it's the sink for a free electron. Yeah. And so that basically creates a protective environment. So let's say in one of these crystal environments, you create something that's akin to glutathione, perhaps something simpler than glutathione. And then the rock fractures. And in that moment, there is a mixture between a protected reaction vessel that has produced some quantity of this chemical that's able to buffer electrons, and it mixes with some kind of proto-RNA. And all of a the sudden, they're in a new environment, and in that new environment, there's a new chiral surface. And it continues to crystallize. And it continues to build progressively more complex crystal structures, and each component is is present in large enough quantities at the moment of mixing to nucleate the next crystal to grow. Okay. And? And you... If you look at the entropic properties of life as not being an accident, if you look at that crystal as being at the heart of what life is, then what we are is a progressively more complex crystal that probably is still being formed in the rock of the earth today. Like that stuff is probably still happening. If, if, it, if it is happening, if it's possible for it to happen, you could go into the rocks and you could still find it happening. And it is... It is an evolution that is, what's the word for, for when it's the simplest way that it could have possibly gone? Occam's razor? It's Occam's razor, but it, parsimonious, I think is the word. Where the production of progressively more complex beings is parsimonious because it is the simplest way that that being can manifest its will and all beings have different will. My will is different from the will of the cat, is different from the will of the tree, is different from the will of the spore, but each organism has will and those wills are carried from generation to generation, which is what gives us species and what gives us types. And what gives us human versus whatever else. Like we have a specific will. And from the moment of the first crystal forming after the earth begins to cool, that crystal has been progressively at each iteration organizing slightly more and more in the direction of us being able to accomplish the things that we accomplish today. Okay. So you want my analysis on that? Yeah. Uh, I, there, there, there's just so insufficient detail to make it insoluble for me. You might remember, I asked Dave Farina to show the coupling between the amino acid D and the amino acid K on the blackboard, and he could not. He just started naming the titles of papers. But the reason that would not work for those amino acids is because one of the papers dealt with an amino nitrile and not an amino acid, so it didn't apply. The second paper could not couple those two because those also had free pieces in them that would interfere. As soon as you, I, if, if, I would, if I were in the same room with you, I would hand you a piece of chalk and you would see that you cannot write for me what you have just said. And as a chemist, I respond to carbon-carbon, carbon-heteroatom bond formations that help me to understand if something can work. And when you speak with such generalities, I cannot process that as a chemist. And I'm trying to be as kind and polite as I can, but it's just, it cannot be processed from a chemical standpoint. So then the next question is, when you're trying to catalyze this specific D and K reaction, 
-hmm. What is the substrate that you would need in order to stabilize that reaction to allow it to happen in a way that is chiral? Can you imagine a substrate okay. that would work the for that? The only thing that works for that that we know of is another enzyme, an enzyme that has already formed, that has already dealt and figured out how to do those DK linkages. So where did I have to get that other enzyme? You would say, oh, that happened on another crystal. Okay, tell me about how that happened on another crystal, because in order to get that to happen, it would have, so the only thing we know is my crystal is, it has to have another enzyme. And these enzymes are so complex. So the one coupling that I had had for him of two glucose molecules coming together, that is done by an enzyme that has, uh, I don't know, 8,000 amino acid units. You can't get enzymes that do this type of chemistry very easily. You, you, you're not going to get it with an enzyme of, uh, of 100 units that happens to, to get this. So it just doesn't make chemical sense. And what I posed to him, every question I posed on the board had no answer. There was no answer. Nobody knows the answer to any of those questions that I posed. That's why I proposed them. And that's why an origin of life researcher, which I'll never again debate a person who is not a real scientist because it just devolves into nonsense. But no origin of life researcher was there to debate me or will debate me because I will give them the same questions and there are no answers to them. As soon as you get to the detail, there is no answer to this. That, that's, that's all I'm saying. And, and uh, um, I agree with you. Before there was a cell, there was life. There was life. And I know, who, I know the name of that life. But as a scientist, we go to the simplest structure we know, and that's a cell. And uh, your little crystalline environments might couple a couple of things. How those couple of things even got in there is very hard to imagine. And why one pocket has amino acids and the other has n nucleotides is very hard to imagine because, be because the entropy has to be extremely low if each pocket has its own type of material. And as soon as you say, no, well, they can have mixed up materials, then the amino acid hooks to the nucleotide, and you're dead. And, and it, it's, it's, just, it's just a chemical complexity which made no sense to me in what you were discussing. Why do you not try to answer these questions as a chemist? You, you mean, what, why do I not go in the lab and do this, or why do I not in my own mind? In your own mind. Oh, in my own mind, I think about this all the time. How would this happen? How would this happen? You know, I, I'm as good a chemist as any one of these origin of life chemists. And I'm not saying that to be proud. I'm just saying that whatever metric you want to apply, I can do what they can do. And I am utterly clueless on how this would come about. And fundamentally, they are too. I have had these private conversations with them and I say to them, you see the problems exactly what I see. You see exactly what I see. And they don't deny it. They just stare at me in silence. None of us know. If anybody on earth could understand this, I should be among that group. And I can't understand it. So I just this is why I'm such a big fan of the eternity hypothesis. That doesn't solve necessarily anything because it had to come from somewhere. No, I, I think that the reason that this is so hard to solve is because we're missing something in what we're trying. Like, look, if you have... Uh, could be. Could be. Right, because... Yeah, it, we're missing something. But I think that what we think we're missing is probably different between you and me. Yeah, it seems to me like what I'm seeing is that you not only think that these avenues are clueless, but you think that the hypotheses themselves are fruitless. Like we're barking up the wrong tree, essentially. Yes, I think their hypotheses are all wrong and they've been proved wrong over and over and over again. And these folks keep blowing stuff out there that make guys like Dave Farina believe them. And, and, and that's why you get all of these people out there believing that life has already been made. 
two thirds of the people, two thirds of the general population feel thinks that scientists have already made living cells because of the nonsense that they spew out there. And what it does is it causes young people to not want to go in the field because they think it's already been solved. Mm. There's great problems to saying something has been solved when it's not been solved. If I say cancer has been solved, all sorts of cancers, they're all solved. Who's going to go into cancer research? This is what we're doing. I think it's this, it's just as bad of a problem in cosmology. I, I don't necessarily want to crack open that can of worms, but you know, I teach astrophysics at a university here, and it's been astounding how we have reified problems into solutions like the problem you you referred to these things as dark matter black this dark that they're really just holes in our understanding that we've made into objects that we can slot into our models and it's sad because the students often think that those are solved problems even though like oh we need to work out the details of dark matter no we literally don't understand how 90 percent of the universe works at a physical level that's what it really means and i think and, it's and Cosmology, I don't know anything about cosmology, but I find it interesting that every 10 years they greatly revise their, their, their <laughs> theories. I mean, it's, it's, in some sense, it's a very similar project because you're talking about something in the very distant reaches of the distant past. You know, origin of life is the same thing, this thing that happened gazillions of years ago, and we're trying to reconstruct it. And all of our evidence is indirect and hypothetical. You know, it's, it's very open to free parameters in the same sense. You can yeah. kind of say whatever you want. And uh, actually, my dissatisfaction with all of those Big Bang stories has, op has again, opened up the possibility of eternity to me from just a mechanistic standpoint. And that's why I've always shrugged away these origins of life stories, because I'm just like, well, maybe it's just always, there always has been life, and you just have eternal panspermia, and that's it. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I also run up against the same issue when I started looking into origins of life many years ago, that I was very dissatisfied, because despite the headlines, there really hasn't been... Nobody's ever made a cell happen or anything even close. No. I just don't no. think that the kind of primary research that is necessary has been done. Because if the place where... Because li life is thought to begin basically at these like black, or the white smoker vents at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, right? So hydrothermal vents, that's the nursery for life. That's where they that, begin. That, that, that's one theory. And it's so hard to separate that because there's so much biological stuff under there that comes blowing out, which confounds everything. Yeah, exactly. So at this point, it's like very difficult. Nick Lane's yes. work is really... I think that you would really like Nick Lane's work. Are you familiar with it? Uh, I, I, I don't, I don't know offhand. I'm sorry. He's a, uh, he's a biochemist and he's coming at this question from a super technical chemistry perspective where his thought is like metabolism first and energy gradients. Oh, okay. The metabolism first. Yeah. Uh, but he has a, he has a good book about it called the vital question. I don't know if you have enough time to, to do reading, but it's to do outside reading. <laughs> you seem like you're very, very busy, but if you were curious, yeah. we could send you the yes. book cause it's, it okay. would it's an interesting and thorough treatment of it that I, I, I wonder what you would have to say about it. And Nick's just a really kind, gentle soul who's very curious and not ideologically motivated. I, I think that you guys would, would have a really productive conversation. Do, even do, if you... does, does he have a solution to the life's origin? No, he, and he doesn't purport to. And he, and okay. he recognizes that it, is, that it is a deeply difficult problem to demonstrate okay. in the laboratory. Then, then we would probably get along very well. Yeah, I, and, yeah. But what I'm trying to say is I'm like, look, doing research about biological stuff that's in the Earth's crust or at the bottom of the Earth's ocean or trying to figure out how exactly things are happening if they're still happening on Earth today is really, really difficult. And very the biological difficult. tools that we have for evaluating what is the smallest possible unit that is cell-like but not yet cell is also almost non-existent. Where if, if there was in the environment a bunch of intermediate points from chemistry, like let's say, let's say that you could go into the, the environment and you could sample stuff and you could find that you don't just have uh, a complex cell that produces long-chain starches using an enzyme that is, you know, 800 kilodaltons or something. Let's say that you found something that was really, really small that was able to use a mineral catalyst to make long chains of glucose, but that's all that it did. Yeah. It didn't do anything else. Okay. All right. All right. So, so 
People have tried this. People have tried to take minerals, mineral surfaces, and put in lots of sophistication into this. And the amount of, of coupling that they do with retention of, of uh, chiral integrity is generally very small. They don't do it cleanly. So every time you try to go in a laboratory and say, okay, I'll, I'll follow along that theme. Many people have looked at, at, at so-called chiral surfaces and you don't get the clean chemistry that you're talking about. You just don't get it. And so... How does, you, you, uh, how does uh, heat and pressure change chiral chemistry at surfaces? Does it increase or decrease purity? And is that... It, it, it's, it's going to go... Generally, heat would generally makes it much worse generally makes it much worse. You have to lower the entropy of the system. You have to keep these molecules from shaking around very much. Pressure can help it. Pressure forces things together. And this is actually what enzymes do. Enzymes, as you know, work at body temperature. They don't do the couplings at the high temperatures that we do. And they essentially do the effect of pressure by locking molecules gently into place so that they push right up against each other. So they are essentially doing what pressure does in a more sophisticated way. And then the other aspect that I've talked a lot about on my videos is that what these enzymes do is not just hand and glove orienting molecules in the right space, uh, as you and I learned when we were in school. Chiral induced spin selectivity tells us that all of the, so all of these electrons go via electron transfer and electron transfers are dictated, they are spin valves. So the chiral environment makes one electron of a particular spin carry out chemistry and not the other. And that gives you very high propensity for these reactions to take place. So, so the enzymes are doing not just the, 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 uh, uh, the physical keeping molecules into place, every one of these junctions is going through what's called a spin valve. You get the right spin coupled with the right spiral, chiral environment, and that's how you get these very large enhancements in chirality. We have no idea how spins are selected. We don't have a chemistry for that. We're just learning. This concept of chiral-induced spin selectivity is only about 15 years old, and just programs are beginning. And I, I I, at, at the Air Force, I pushed them to start a program, so they've they've started several programs now and uh, uh, several joint grants on on chiral induced spin selectivity, which I don't work on, but this is going to be fundamental as well. Sorry to get too technical. No, I don't think that's too technical at all. I think that okay. what you what you say is super important because this is the crux of the matter, right? It's that. The chemistry is not incidental. It is no small feat. And in order to be able to make the complex things that we have today, an enormous amount of chemistry had to have happened in order to produce them. And that's a combinatorial problem that seems intractable because you look at the number of molecules necessary for even a single protein, and then you think about, well, how could they have possibly come together? Computationally impossible, more than the age of the universe, more numbers of molecules than are available in the universe to have come together to create just one of these, let alone massive quantities of them. And, and remember, when you, when you took those two amino acids together, that, that is, the delta G is positive, which means that that reaction does not want to go, which means that now once you have that coupling, it wants to reverse, it wants to go back. And any catalyst has the, it's the principle of microscopic reversibility. It catalyzes both the forward reaction and the reverse reaction over the same pathway. And these are all have positive free energy. They don't want to go, and that's going to be the same on any, uh, in this universe, at any point in time of this universe, that, that reaction would have a positive delta G. It wants to come apart, doesn't want to polymerize. So you have to have some sort of sophisticated way of driving away the water as soon as the thing coupled so it stays together. And then once you expose it to water to do the next step, it's going to be favoring to hydrolyze this thing. It's a really hard problem, really hard. Same thing with sugars. 
Every one of those anomeric bonds wants to go back the other way because the entropy goes way, way up. It's very favorable. And that's why Delta G is always positive on these things. What do you make of discoveries of sugars and proteins or polypeptides in uh, interstellar objects? Yeah. So, so as far as I know, there are not that many polypeptides. There's certainly amino acids, mm-hmm. yeah. and there there are certainly sugars. Generally, what we find is that they do not have very high enantiomeric excess. They're generally racemic. Mm-hmm. There's been a couple of cases where you've seen as much as, say, 70, 65% EE on sugars was the highest that was seen. And it's generally not with the sugars that we know. It's, it's diastereomers of some of the sugars that, that, that we're familiar with. Uh, and they're mixed in with all the other sugars, so they would be utterly useless. You can make vast mixtures by the foremost reaction, but they're utterly useless even to the chemist today who has these very advanced methods of separating them. Once you have mixtures of sugars, they're very hard to work with because you just get this agglomeration of junk. All right, so you certainly find them. You find amino acids. They're generally racemic. Sometimes you find them with some level. So that's why I gave this young man all of these in in a, a complete 100% 100% enantiomeric excess. Now you have to polymerize them together. There is the really hard step because these go through a process where delta G is positive, so the reaction does not want to go. Once the hydrolyze go the other way, that's why RNA decomposes so rapidly. That's why uh, 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 the peptides decompose, the sugars, the, the, the polypeptides go back to the amino acids, and the sugars want to go back to the 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 monosaccharide, not to the polysaccharide, and the 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 regiochemistry is very hard. How do you get them to hook together? Where you get a C terminus to the N terminus to the C terminus doesn't happen. Any technique that we can think of, thermal crystal surface, it, it's all an utter mess. And as soon as you start hooking off those side branches, it doesn't work anymore. It's it's game over. As soon as one of those, when you polymerize RNA on Montmorillo, and when you make RNA from nucleotides on Montmorillonite, these clays, you get thirty to seventy percent, often seventy percent of the two five, not the three five linkage, and you get branching. It's game over. Once you get the branching, it's game over. So that's why as soon as you get somebody on a blackboard. The chemistry doesn't work. We don't know how to make the the polymers. And I'm not the first to point this out. The polymers stop everybody. Making the polymerized structures stops everybody. And we've got to make the polymerized forms. Not only is it hard to get the enantipure compounds, and you want to hook sugar to sugar. If you have amino acids around, amino acids are going to attack that glycosidic site as well. And so you, you now have amino acid hooked on to a sugar and so how are you going to make your polysaccharide? You say, well, that's, that's the beginnings of, of you know, some cell membrane. Yeah, but it's an utter mess. You don't know how to deal with it. So the details of the chemistry make this so hard to fathom that I'm not trying to play coy here. I'm not trying to be the instigator of trouble. I'm just shouting out the obvious to the chemist. The poor man on the street, Dave Farina, he, the poor man doesn't know. What I learned in that thing is all he could do was read a script. He just doesn't know. But the chemist sees exactly what I see. But they claim something else. Steve Benner, nice guy. We were together a year ago in Israel. And, and somebody else asked him, okay, if you had all these components, how would you put this together? You, could you do this? He says, well, you know, a career is four score. I'm three and a half score into my career. I'll leave this to other people. <laughs> And the next day I challenged him on I said, Steve, you should have said you can't do it because you can't. Why do you keep saying that? Why do, this, is, this is why I keep shouting this thing out. These guys keep saying, and Steve has said, we, we, we've got this all figured out. We're up to the point right up where Dar- Darwinian evolution will take over. This, this is why, you know, Jim Tours keeps shouting this stuff out. And now I'm person non grata. Uh, next time that you see Steve Benner, tell him to answer our emails. 
Uh, okay, I might see him next year if he shows up to the conference. I, I find Steve Benner to be a wonderful guy. I really do. And I find, I find Lee Cronin to be very nice. I mean, so, so and, and Jack Sawstech. It's just that, that I disagree with their extrapolations and what they're saying. Although, if you had listened to the end of that seminar, you would have, to the end of that, that, that thing, which would have been, you know, a, a hellish experience, but you would have seen that Lee Cronin is now saying that origin of life is a scam. Is a scam. This is an origin of life researcher saying origin of life research is a scam. And he was asked to explain it on a podcast and he explained it. He says, because one person makes one molecule after another and after another. And now what? Any cell that has been made, you've taken an existing cell and you put a genome in it and that goes back to Luca. So, so um, uh, he says, nobody's even really doing it, he said. So I say we're clueless. Lee Cronin is now saying it's a scam. Who's kinder? <laughs> I think it's a fascinating question. I think that we come across this in many fields where there is someone who is standing adjacent or on the outside and they're like, hey, I don't think that what you're saying bears weight. And we do it for physics, we do it for geology, we do it for biology. And I think that it's really important because something that you said, which is that if people come into a field and they think that something is figured out, they won't look at it. And I think that you're absolutely right that the story of science has to be continuous. You can't point to something and be like, well, what if it's happening like this? And then there's just some time, luck, chance lives in between and then it comes out the other side and all of a sudden that you have something really complex. And so from where I'm sitting, I think that we're missing important pieces that will help us figure out what the stepping stones are because I think that our techniques are insufficient to actually figure out what life looks like because the only picture that we have of life right now is cells and I don't think that's accurate. Okay. So, so not everybody would agree with you most people would say it comes from cells, yeah. but, but the frustrating thing is here, th think about what, what we are taught, what people are taught all the time. These things came together and over millions and billions of years, this happened. As a chemist, over a weekend, things turned to garbage. These things hydrolyze, they saponify, they cleave. And, and uh, uh, you, you have a graduate student who wants to go away for a weekend and leaves that reaction running without isolating it, he or she pays the price and they learn to never do that again. Time is the enemy of organic compounds. They decompose. And to say that millions of years take care of it is, is just, just, you know, this is part of the problem and this is what we're up against. And this is why I've come out so strongly in it. I'm not sure that, that uh, um, it's, been, it, it's been worth it, but yeah, it's been a ride. You know, my hat's already thrown in the ring. I can't back out now. Well, I hope that you won't leave solving these questions to the next generation. Oh, I'm going to leave solving these questions to the next generation. I can guarantee it. I will die before the origin of life is solved. And that's what I keep saying, and that, that every researcher in this area will die and every one of their students will die before this is solved because we know we're not getting closer. And the way we know we're not getting closer is you look at it like any systems problem, is that, is that every year the simplest of cells becomes more complex faster than we're moving toward it. So the target is moving away faster than we are being able to approach it not because the cell is evolving more complex, the simplest of cells that we can model, I know you don't like cells, but the simplest of cells that we can model is we discover new areas of complexity. So there's, you know, the Leventhal paradox. How does a protein fold? But there's Leventhal 2.0. How do you get these intermolecular interactions that run in a simple yeast cell 10 to the... Uh, uh, 10 to the 7 billion, 10 to the 70 billion, 10 to the 70 billion is the number of combinations of just protein-protein interactions in a single yeast cell, and only a few of those are going to operate. But that's, so hold, that on, is, but hold on, like a, a cell isn't just a soup of proteins. Absolutely. These just protein-protein interaction, the order between them, 
you ha- so what happens is information propagates through a cell. A cell is an information-loaded system. How does information propagate through a system? And we showed this years ago in molecular electronics, is that you line up molecules and you do a perturbation. This perturbation modifies the molecular orbitals, which modifies the molecular orbitals, and the information is passed down with a very long coherence length at very low energies. And this is why a cell doesn't burn up. That order on how these molecules are aligned is critical for information flowing through a cell. We just learned that. That is called the interactome problem, Leventhal 2.0. The number of combinations of arrangements that you would have that will not work is so utter, 10 to the 70 billion. I mean, this is this crazy, crazy numbers that you could have a billion, billion universes of time and it wouldn't be enough. This is what we're up against. That's why I say we're not going to solve this. And I guarantee you, I'm going to leave this to the next generation and the next and the next because we cannot get this thing solved. So if there's something simpler than a cell that's going to get us there, we need that. All right, I'll start looking. All right. Thank you for giving us so much of your time today. This has been incredible. And, and I really hope this isn't the last time that we meet you. Maybe we'll get to meet you in person one day. It's, it's, been, a, it's been a real pleasure to spend this, this afternoon with you. And, and I know that you're extremely busy and it just means a lot to me that you, you took the time out of your day to come by. So I just want to thank you one more time before we sign off. Agreed. Well, thank you so much. I, I, I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, I'll post this on my YouTube channel after you post it. And my YouTube channel is, uh, uh, DR James tour. At, and, uh, so, so, um, it's not, it's not as, you know, I'm, I'm just, just trying to build my YouTube channel as well, you know, in my spare time as I can. And maybe we, we will meet in person. I'm a lot less impressive in person than, than I am <laughs> sitting behind my desk, but, uh, I'll do the best I can. Thank Thank you for your time and for, uh, I, I never thought I could sit for three hours and, and talk. I did it. I'm, I'm proud of myself. If you're enjoying this series, give us a thumbs up and click the subscribe button. And that way you'll hear when we're coming out with new videos. There are no salaried employees in this organization. All the accounting, all the legal work, that's all done by friends of mine. The only thing that I have to pay for is the production work. And if you could help us out with that, I'd appreciate it. There's a link below where you can just click on that and help us in several different ways. Thank you. Thank you.